everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles, and I hope you guys are all having a wonderful Wednesday. Most of you are going to be hearing this on Wednesday. And this is our Saturday free show episode. We went a little long on this because we had uh, an extra member of the crew uh, joining us as not a guest for a change, but joining us as a Saturday crew member was none other than Stefan Bertrand Lee, who, (laughs) if you watch the show, is lovingly known as Thor Guevara. And the reason why you guys call him Thor Guevara is because of his photos, and I believe it was a Jacobin article that came out about him. He was the uh, young man that was perpetually online, and he was on the online left, and he was memeing, and he got tired of being an online. He was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to go in the mountains and uh, go fight with the Kurds. Go join the Kurdistan Workers Party. Memeing for liberation. He tells a very funny story. There's a movie being made about him. We're very excited for, for when that actually gets to come out. Because uh, Stefan is, is a, Stefan is a super smart person, first of all, and love his insight. What I really love about Stefan is his wit. Stefan is hilarious. So, a great addition for this episode because we talked to. In this episode, uh, Frederic Gierdink. Gierdink. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm probably not saying that right because I'm really bad at uh, pronunciations. Pronunciations. But anyway, much like Stefan, uh, she went to cover uh, the Kurdish movement. And in in Turkey, uh, particularly, and actually got kicked out. So it's it was a, it was her story first of all of leaving uh, Denmark to cover uh, pretty much crazy guerrilla warfare. <laughs> That's insane. And then also, after the show, we got into a good conversation about... We tried to talk to uh, Frederic for uh, about an hour, hour and some change. She only had a limited amount of time. And then we got into an interesting conversation after she left about access journalism. Access journalism on the left as well. And we got into a conversation about the idea of speaking truth to power. So if you want to watch these conversations in real time and comment and understand the inside jokes that you are missing out on, because the chat is hilarious, there's one way to do it. The best way to do it. There's actually more than one way to do it. But the best way to do it is youtube.com backslash this is revolution podcast. We do live streams now four nights a week. Tuesday and Thursday and Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. But on Wednesday, it's a special live stream. On Wednesday, we have the uh, TIR Presents. This is Revolution Presents. And if you listen to this show this Wednesday, then later on tonight, 
Maria Repnikova will be doing her show, Masha and the Bears, which is more of an academic take, an academic deep dive on foreign policy issues. And I'm sure you say, but you guys always have academics on there. But imagine just a whole bunch of them. More. Big panels. Academics. Less jokes. No mow mowing. No 50 year counter revolution. No fat back and biscuit talk. And on Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific time, we have our free show. A lot more fun, a little more free. We. More people on the panel. Again, if you want to be a part of the chat and comment, be part of the community, we want you to be part of the community. The best way to do it, youtube.com backslash this is Revolution Podcast. And for Tuesday and Thursday, those shows only go an hour, and then we go into the Patreon after hours. And recently, on last Thursday with Michael Albert, we went like two hours after hours and Michael Albert told us some great stories about him and Hugo Chavez and and Noam Chomsky chilling interesting stories if you want to hear those stories those behind the velvet rope paywall stories wow gotta be a patron patreon.com backslash bitter lake presents is the best way to do it but this episode again is our conversation with Frederic here, Dink. I don't want to say her name wrong. I feel so bad. And wherever you're listening, there's links in the description of her book, The Fire Never Dies. About her year. About her banishment from Turkey. It's a crazy story. That music means I gotta shut up now. I am out. Hello and good morning all and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles. And before we even get started, before I introduce my co-host, please hit the like and subscribe button. Did you do it? All right. Without any further ado, he is my homie, my dog. We were on two other shows yesterday, we, so we're a little we're a little worn out. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Did you get a good night's sleep of rest and relaxation, Jason? No. I'm sorry to hear that. Because you didn't mow mow enough. Anyway, we're not going to discuss that. 
And since it's Saturday, we have our Saturday homie. He is now residing in Chocolate City, somewhere in Virginia. Is he near the capital or is he near Richmond? We'll tell you. Marcus of the Left Flank Vets. I can still, I can, I'll tell you, I'll be honest. I can smell the swamp. Uh, I, can, I can smell the swamp. And he's everyone's favorite professor in the state of Missouri. Me, Gene Bajlan. Greetings, everybody. It's wonderful to be here this morning. How are you doing, Jason? How are you doing, Pascal? And how are you doing, Marcus? <laughs> A lot of people keep saying I did drugs. I did not do drugs. I don't do drugs. I'm very anti-drugs for me. And they cost money. I don't have any money. It'd be silly to spend money on things I don't have. So. And we have a special guest host today. He has been a guest on this show several times. You may know him by his This Is Revolution moniker, Thor Guevara. <laughs> Stefan Perch. <laughs> That is your name from now on whenever you're on this show. I just want you to know that. Good. I haven't had a nickname in a while. <laughs> That's a bad it's, nickname, man. Uh, is, is today or was yesterday the anniversary of his assassination? Oh, Guevara is today. Yeah, today. It's today, yeah. I thought it was yesterday. Oh, oh wow. Maybe I saw a post from yesterday. Uh, or no, or Skinny seven. Thor. Yeah. You also Skinny Thor is also another uh, moniker, but I like Thor Rivera better than Skinny Thor. Thor Rivera is much cooler. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I'm that cool, but you know, nicknames just you take. Know, they it. don't need to be accurate, do they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. I mean, when it comes to cool background, points, background accuracy is not important. Could be your Tinder profile shot, <laughs> and your DMs would be ridiculously full. You know, there is there is a very well known. Uh, Atlantic writer who I um, will not name, but apparently like he wrote a book and got a blurb from David Petraeus and he actually put David Petraeus's book blurb in his Tinder profile. <laughs> I think that would only attract women in a very, very, very narrow setting. He lives uh, in D.C. Okay. Somebody said he was captured yesterday and he was killed today. Sad. Rip. Shit, no. Um, before we bring in our esteemed guests, we had made a video um, about the Kurdish question when uh, Stefan uh, first came on the show. How many months ago was that? Was that like two or three months ago? No, it was quite. It was at least five. It's like it five like months ago. Yeah. No. Time is I just I just re enlarge your mind. <laughs> and on the that chat, note, the chat has jokes already, man. And on that note, Skinny Thor. civil war has been one of the bloodiest civil wars of the decade, leaving hundreds of thousands of dead and millions displaced. The conflict, which originated in a rebellion against Syrian dictator Bashar Assad, has since spiraled into a seemingly endless cycle of violence, drawing in a number of international players in from Turkey, Iran, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Great Britain, and the United States. The war is often portrayed as being between a ruthless secular dictatorship and an opposition that has, over the years, come to be dominated by the most brutal and hardline Islamist groups, most notably ISIS. However, in Syria's predominantly Kurdish-inhabited northeast, known locally as Rojava, a different political force emerged, the YPG, a libertarian socialist militia that came to prominence in the context of the fight against ISIS. 
Although heavily criticized by elements of the Western left for its military alliance with the United States, the organization also attracted support from many anarchists and socialists who went to fight alongside the Kurds. This week on This Is Revolution, we speak to one such individual, Stefan Bertram Lee, about what inspired them to join the Kurds and what they found when they arrived in Rojava. This is Revolution. Didn't that look hard with the fade out? That was hard. That was a good video. That was a good video. <laughs> well, we have a we have a very esteemed guest today that uh, we need to bring in, who also spent some time in Kurdish Iraqistan. <laughs> Jean. Yeah, so uh, Frederike Gerding is a Dutch journalist and author who specializes in Kurdish affairs and the women's movement. And between uh, 2012 and 2015, she was the only foreign journalist based in Diyarbakir, which is the basically the spiritual capital of the Kurdish regions of Turkey. It's the largest, uh, largest city there, and it's also a main center of political activity. In 2015, she was arrested and deported by the Turkish authorities and has uh, since written extensively, you know, she has written extensively on the Kurdish movement and she recent pu recently published her second book, This Fire Never Dies. And that is based on her year long experience embedded with members of the Kurdistan Workers Party known uh, better known by its Kurdish ap acronym, the PKK, Partiya Kekariyana Um And yeah, she, she wrote a book on that and it's kind of a fascinating insight because there are very few Western journalists who have actually spent a significant time with uh, Kurdish fighters. Uh, you know, some people occasionally go up there for a fluff piece about uh, uh, cool Kurdish women fighters, but uh, uh, Frederica really, you know, like spent a lot of time you know, up there, learning the ideology, you know, talking to people and having extended interviews. So one of her, her book is really like a very important primary source on the Kurdish movement in Turkey specifically, but more broadly, uh, you know, an important left-wing faction of the Kurdish movement. Frederica. Happy to be here, happy to bring the percentage of women in this revolutionary podcast up to 16%. <laughs> she comes in, shots fired. Shots fired. I, I like, I mean, that's I like fair. The claiming the space in the room. I, I appreciate that. Leveling that's, your authority, that's, that's a good thing. It's definitely Frederica. fair. Frederica, welcome to This Is Revolution podcast. Thank you so much. Thank for you for having me. And um, if, you know, to get to a kind of just basic understanding for our audience who may not be familiar with the question in general that you deal with in your book and in your work, can you explain or define for our audience what exactly is the PKK? What is its political orientation and what role does it serve in the overall geopolitical struggle of the Kurdish movement, if you don't mind going to that kind of basic explanation so he sort of framing and evolve from there. Yeah, uh, PKK was uh, founded in 1978. Um, it actually origin originates not in, um, in Kurdish nationalism, but in the Turkish leftist movement in, in the capital city of Ankara, in student circles. Um, and the discussion at the time was um, in the 70s about colonialism. Um, the, the, the general Turkish left said that um, Turkey needed to be liberated from um, American imperialism and then the liberation of the East, as it was called at the time, the East, um, would, would automatically come. But the group around Öcalan... Um, said no we the, the liberation of turkey goes through kurdistan actually and, and kurdistan is colonialized as well 
the Turk Turkish left thought that Kurdistan couldn't be colonized because Turkey itself was a colony, considered to be a colony. Um, but the group around Öcalan said, yeah, um, Kurdistan is definitely colonized and by, by four different countries, actually, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria. So we have to focus on, on Kurdistan. Um, initially, they were called the Kurdistan Revolutionaries. And in 78, uh, PKK was founded and they were um, leftist and rooted in Marxism and striving for a Kurdish nation state. Um, and they attacked the state for the first time, the Turkish state for the first time in 1984. And ever since it's been war and Turkey has never um, really made a democratic effort to to solve all the problems that are at the at the roots at the at the yeah at the roots of of this um, of this movement. So so it continues till now. Wow! <clears throat> How exactly does the PKK try to set up the concept of sovereignty within a kind of uh, area of conflict? where state recognition is up is up for grabs, particularly when you have uh, the Kurdish question be addressed, as you stated, in four different countries. What are the kind of terms upon which they view sovereignty to be based upon in that kind of very difficult space to navigate? Well, it was um it has changed since they're not they're not fighting for a for a nation state anymore. But um at the time they wanted to liberate like the whole of Kurdistan um and they it it of course it meant to to um break down the the existing states which is um according to international law very difficult um and Turkey would of course never ever allow it because the unity of of Turkey is is sacred um, but in the 1990s, they sort of had a paradigm shift, um, like maybe the nation state is part of the problem and we should not strive uh, to have a nation state anymore. And then uh, they started to think about what, what other um, goal they could fight for, which is in general... Um, <laughs> Phrased as just democracy, if you if you look at the the whole movement in Turkey, they're striving for democracy, but not not sort of a democracy that you would see in Western countries, because of course the whole the whole world exists of nation states. So um, it is a very decentralized um, form of democracy, very local, community based form. Uh, of autonomy. Um, and as you guys have described that uh, different perspective, you know, and at least coming from all these nation states and even how these uh, areas are organized. Um, can you one, I guess, explain uh, how are you able to be one of the few foreign journalists? And then how does that also shape, you know, your perspective, you think, and your experiences? Um, while you were there, yeah. Why? Why? It, why? I was one of the f f few. Well, the the only Western journalist who ever spent so much time with PKK. Um, it's not so hard. You just need to have the idea and ask them. That's basically like, I was kicked out of Turkey in September um, fifteen, and two months later, I went to Kandil to the mountains where the headquarters are based for an interview with the co-leader Jamil Bayik. But I had interviewed him and the other co-leader, Besser Rosat, a couple of times already. And you sort of get, you can sort of guess what their answers to your questions are going to be. And of course, they are the, the so they, they use the interview to get their message out. And that has never really been my kind of journalism. Also, when I was based in Turkey in Diyarbakir, I was always traveling around. And sometimes I would talk to politicians, but or to um, people with official um, functions. But I would prefer to talk to the people 
and see what they live and write their stories down. So I thought maybe I should, I was waiting for Jamil Bayik to arrive to, to the interview and I was looking, looking over this valley. It was so beautiful. It was autumn and it was stunning. And I thought, shit, I want to be here, but I'm not a fighter. And then I thought, oh, but I'm a journalist. Yeah, that, that, that opens some options. So the, the, press, the press man was with me, the press uh, representative of the PKK. And I said, hey, I have this crazy plan. And he said, oh, we like crazy plans. <laughs> Tell us about it. So I said, what if I join you for a whole year and I just write the story from within and I talk to the normal, you know, the, the common fighters, not to the leadership, but to the common fighters. And um, I write a book about it. And um, he discussed it internally. And like two months later, he called me and said I was welcome, which on one side I was happy. On the other side, I thought, shit, now I have to, now it's, now, now the ball is in my court, you know, now I have to decide if I'm actually going to do this or not, because um, I only wanted to do it journalistically. So I didn't want to have like any restrictions. I didn't want them to say, you cannot ask this, you cannot bring this up, you cannot talk to this person, that person, whatever. Um, and I talked to colleagues and, um, you know, if it would be a good idea and everybody thought that it was. Um, and I asked the PKK if they had any conditions. And they said, the only condition is that you follow the security instructions, which seemed to be a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> and that was all. So I went and then I had, it started in uh, June uh, 16. So I, I started uh, with, an, with an interview with Jamil Bayuk again, the co-leader. And I also asked him, like, why, why did you give me permission any uh, restrictions or demands and he said we're open to everybody who sincerely wants to get to know us better and i think that's true because they kept their promise i they didn't they didn't restrict me nobody ever found any question weird nobody you know um and i think that's it so if somebody else would have asked it they they would have welcomed them too of course, they knew me already, and they knew that I had reported from Diabakar, and I had visited them and reported. Um, so they trusted me to do it well and with integrity. And, and they knew that I, that I try as much as possible to look through the Kurdish, from the Kurdish perspective. Um, but, but something funny happened because some, in, in general, I was depending on the PKK to take me from, diff, from one location to the other. And one time it took, a little, took, me, it took too long. I was impatient and I, I thought they should um, mm -hmm. help me to get to B quicker. And I told this to, to, the, to the media um, official. And I said to encourage him, I said, you have to help me because I want to write a really good book. Um, and that's in your interest too. And he said as a joke, but it was really telling. He said, oh, it's okay. There are many bad books about the PKK already. We can add another one. No problem. You know, so it was, they're very confident, you know, they, if, if I wrote a shit book about them, it was more a problem for me than for them because they are secure enough, uh, in, in their struggle. I would uh, I would like to ask you though. So you know, by the time you went to uh, write write your book and do your research uh, with the PKK, you were already you know a veteran of journalism in in, um, in Kurdistan, as you mentioned. You uh, you were in Diyarbakir. You also wrote a book uh, on the Robuski massacre, which uh, uh, which was uh, an, for our viewers, it was an event where the Turkish military uh, killed civilians. Uh, basically killed a bunch of civilians who were smuggling uh, 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 on the grounds that they were members of the PKK and that they were fighters. 
So I would like to ask, how did you first get involved in, in, in reporting on the Kurdish question and learn about the Kurdish question? And, uh, you know, um, what sort of what sort of drove you to, to go to Diyarbakir uh, and report? And a kind of second question on top of that is, uh, you're a Western journalist, obviously. Uh, what would you be your critiques of Western journalists who report on the Kurdish question? Why, why, why do you think uh, Western reporters who report on the Kurdish question do so the way they do? And what problems do you think are with that kind of uh, reporting in general? Okay. Um, I, I went to Turkey in 2006 as a, as a freelance uh, journalist. I've been in, in journalism for long, like 30 years now. Um, but I went to Turkey as a freelance correspondent in 2006, and I was already interested in human rights issues, but I look at that very different now than I looked at it then. But at the time, um, at the time, I thought in the Netherlands there were not really big issues to write about. Can you imagine that? Oh, I was very white when I left. I was very white. Um, and I was based in Istanbul. And I wrote about all kinds of things, also for women's magazines, for travel magazines, for, I don't know, for, for a human rights magazine, for weekly news magazines, all kinds of media. And then this Roboski uh, massacre happened. It was on 28 December 2011. Uh, I worked for a Dutch uh, news agency at the time as well. And I went like five days after after it happened. I I went there to make two quick stories, like one for a news agency and one for a youth youth magazine, because most the the majority of the victims of the massacre were uh, were underaged. And I came. I reported for one day. Talk about criticism on the, in general Western journalism. Um, and I came back to Istanbul and I realized that I had so many more questions than answers. So I went back several times to figure out what really happened. And then for, for longer periods of time, sometimes a week, sometimes three weeks. And then I found out that, you know, I, I, I investigated the massacre, but also the history of the people in that village. And they, it was not the first disaster that happened to them already in the 1990s. They were um, displaced from the village where they lived before. And I dug further into history. And, um, and then I thought, if I describe this massacre and all, all the backgrounds of it, I can really explain the whole Kurdish issue in Turkey. And that's a book. And then... In 2012, I wanted to be closer to the village. And I thought I'm going to stay in Diyarbakir for three months. So I'm closer to there and I can do the final research. But then I was in Diyarbakir and it, I really liked staying there because Diyarbakir is very political. Everything is about politics. And that is what my basic interest is politics. And there was no other foreign journalist base there. In, in general, foreign journalists in Turkey, they go to the Kurdish regions when there are elections or when it's Nevros, the Kurdish New Year, or when there is general violence. So I thought we need to look at this from a Kurdish perspective as well, <clears throat> and that um, for me, it's a, it was really this Roboski massacre was very important for me in my in my journalism and and in my life because it it radically changed the way I I looked at journalism and at society at power because I had some Turkish friends, also journalists, who said to me that I had to be careful not to become too pro-Kurdish or too activist. And I didn't want that, of course. It scared me very much because I love journalism and I think it's important. And I thought, 
I'm going to, maybe I'm going to be an activist and that's very bad. I have to be a journalist and I can't lose my profession. And, you know, I, I thought about it so much. And then the solution was not so complicated. I thought this is mo more journalistic than I've ever done because mm. I'm looking here really at the people who have no power and journalism should be about holding power to account. So um, if I still have access to, to Erdogan or to anybody in power in Turkey, maybe I'm doing something wrong as a journalist and, I'm, and I was losing all that access. And, and some of the people who were working for mainstream media in Turkey slowly, slowly started to see me as an activist. But I was not an activist because that has different methods. I, I never, you know, I'm never, walk, never walking around with banners or shouting slogans. And I know some of the, some of the songs now that also people, you know, sing when there are gatherings, but I never sing along. And I never, I never stand with the symbols in the air or something. And I, and sometimes people look at me like, why isn't she joining? But for that, I always have my radio recording device mm. and my pen and my notebook. So it's like, sorry, people, my hands are full. This is all I can do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a, you know, I, I thought this is more journalistic than I've ever done. Also, because in Turkey, you, you can't have like um, in, in the Netherlands, my home country, it's getting more difficult, too. But um Freedom of Information Acts, you know, there's no such thing in Turkey, you know. So if you want to know, is there an army base at the small mountain road where these smugglers go every night since decades? So the army knows that these people are not PKK fighters, but poor people who try to make some money. The only thing you can do is walk up that road and check out if there is an army post. And I did, and I saw the army post. So, you know, check is that I think that's journalism, you know, you're, you're forced in such environment to, to really um, resort to, to these kind of basic journalistic methods and holding power to account. And if they, and if Why I would have you... found that they were PKK fighters, I would have written that down, of course, but they weren't, you know. You didn't want to just try Google Maps? That, that wasn't uh, an option either. Well, the interesting thing was that when I, when I went there, um, I went early in the day to the village. The, the, the smuggling starts when, when it starts to get dark. And there were actually military going on the same road. Like the, um, the, the mules and the soldiers were using the same road. And I can read that in Kurdish media. And I have found that they are in general reliable, but I have to see it with my own eyes, you know, and I yeah. saw it. Kurdish media don't even write it because they know it's already, you know, it's not nothing mm -hmm. new, but for my stuff, for my book, it was important. So yeah, being on the, there's nothing, nothing compares to being on the ground, you know, Google maps. Yeah. So Frederico, what do you see as the main dynamics of the, Kurdish question in Turkey today. What do you think are the driving issues behind that? Well, I've been thinking about it, and there's a lot of dynamics going on. There's a historical one dating back to 1923 when the Republic of Turkey was founded. Um, on what you can see as fascist principles. Um, and not not too many people zoom out that that much in their reporting. It's always like, oh, there's elections coming up, so they can't really do something. Or um, there's this there's the dynamic in Syria, there's the dynamic in Iraq, there's the relations with Russia, and this is all true. Um, but but the core of the problem is that Kurds are not allowed to exist the way they want to be. They cannot live their identity. They cannot live who they want to be. Um, and nobody has addressed that issue. And because Erdogan has been 
in power for so long now. It is sometimes looked at as a as a problem of Erdogan, and of course Erdogan is definitely a very big problem. But he didn't really change the state. He is just using all the institutions of the state to his advantage and to strengthen his power. The only thing that he sort of fundam fundamentally changed was changing from the parliamentary system to presidential system. But that is just enforcing the structures that were already there, which is very centralized power. Um, so Erdogan didn't address it, but his, pre his predecessors also didn't address it. And, and the core goes back to Ottoman times, um, when the Kurds were, for a large extent, um, autonomous. But it, it changed halfway the 19th century because the Ottoman Empire was falling apart. Um, and that's kind of interesting to, to, to say because um, in the Ottoman Empire, there was not really something like a very strong Turkish or Kurdish identity. The people in, who had power considered themselves to be Ottomans, and they could be Turks or Kurds, um, but Muslims. So the, those in power, the, the, the Kurds, were like clan leaders, and they were cooperating with the state and suppressing their people. But halfway the 19th century, um, the, the Ottoman Empire wanted to centralize and um, subjugate the, the Kurdish clans. Um, but they always found a new balance again between the, the power of the, 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 the Kurdish clan leaders and the state. And then the Republic happened. And Possibly Kurdish leaders thought we're going to find a new balance again within this Republic of Turkey, but that totally didn't happen. And the name Turkey could have been a red flag, you know, <laughs> land of the Turks. Hey, you know, hey, land of the Turks. Mm -hmm. Where are we in this? Um, but then every every uprising that happened was really very brutally um, suppressed. And, and the most well-known is the Dersin mass massacres of 1937 and 38. Um, and after that, there were not really uprisings anymore. And many Kurds forgot that they were Kurds. And people sometimes say like Kurdish was forbidden, but it, is, it goes much deeper than that. Because Kurdish did not exist, Kurdish culture did not exist. I, I read a very interesting uh, law book about that. That, that digs into to identity and minorities, minorities in Turkish law, something that can that doesn't exist. You can't ban something that doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. If they ban Kurdish, they'd have to acknowledge Kurdish, right? And it's, it's a pure yeah. like a nation strategy. So the whole the Turkish um, constitution and the Turkish law books, everything is about Turkish. The one and only language is Turkish culture turkish it, it says turkish culture all the time would you, turkish people turkish so kurdish doesn't need, you don't have to ban it something doesn't exist you don't would, you, would you say it's different than what you saw in the americas with uh that level of colonization and maybe like the natives for example they just didn't acknowledge the uh the kurdish existence is that what you're saying yeah and they're not acknowledging totally, their existence deep. yeah totally denied and that had that has to do with with um with the net already saying that you're a Kurd is problematic because there is some, there is a Turkish nationalism is also tied to Islam. And then the, the Sunni state Islam, they say Turkey is um, secular, but it's not. There is a, there's a um, Sunni state Islam in Turkey that is taught in all the mosques and, and in schools. <coughs> And there is this tur very Turkish nationalist, like even Grey Wolves, they, they acknowledge now that the Kurds exist, but they say there's a brotherhood. And this brotherhood means that they have a common history and a common culture and a common religion and a common homeland. And if you even say like, hey, maybe my history is different than yours. Maybe I have different 
uh, leaders. May, maybe I have different music. That is already separatism because it breaks, it breaks this bond between Kurds, uh, Kurds and Turks who have the same religion. And the other religions, like, uh... when, when, the, when the Republic was founded, like um, Christians, they had to go. Like there was this population exchange between Greece and Turkey. And, and the, the Greeks in Turkey had to go to Greece and, and the Turks in Greek had to go to Turkey. And we called it population exchange, but it was an ethnic cleansing, of course. And those who remained, like, you know, had to be Turks. And, that's, and that is the problem up until today. So if you want to solve it, you have to, that's also what the Kurdish non-armed movement says, you have to rewrite the constitution and take all this Turk out. You know, there is, and there's much more diversity, of course, you know, there's, Anatolia is very rich in, the whole Middle East is very rich in, in religion. Like in the Middle East, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Islam have their roots there. Humanity comes from there, like language, like it's multilingual, multicultural, multi-ethnic. So by this Turkish nationalism, a lot of diversity has, has died. And that's very sad, to say the least. Stefan, you um, want to say something? I wanted to say something, but I'm going to move on to ask Frederick another question. Um, <clears throat> Frederick, could you talk about uh, your like time with the PKK, like both in the terms of like what units you were with, what friends you were with, which organizations you were with, like were you with just a normal group of, of, of fighters? Were you with like the media group? I think you initially you were at a language school, right? And also describe um, for people who don't know, like kind of the daily life in PKK. because so I think daily life in PKK and Yepige are, are quite similar with kind of the communal living and waking up very early and, and doing all these things. But obviously most, apart from me and you, we don't really know these things. So if you could describe that, I think that'd be good. Yeah. Yeah, true. I ended up first three months in a language course under the walnut trees, <laughs> um, which was really amazing because I had tried already starting in 2012 in Istanbul to learn Kurdish, but in Istanbul on the fish market, you can't really practice your Kurdish. Which is, <laughs> You know, they wouldn't get violent to a white Dutch woman, but <laughs> they wouldn't understand you either. Or maybe they would. They wouldn't charge control. you more for fish. Yeah, probably. Or throw it at your head. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Turks would never do that. They would pack it nicely. Sorry. Um, and even in Diyarbakir, I tried to learn Kurdish. Also didn't happen because, because of assimilation. You know, you, you don't see Kurdish also on the street in, in Diyarbakir. So it, I was very frustrated about it. So I was happy when they said like, Hey, why don't you start with a language course? Um, seven days a week, uh, in the mornings we had lessons and in the afternoon we did our homeworks. Um, and we swam in the river. Um, we had to go to our tents at eight because electricity was not allowed. And at eight, it's, um, you know, it got dark. So, you know, we get sleep and wake up at 5.30 again. Um, and I know all the Kurdish grammar now, but there's a lot of distance between what I know here and what comes out here. So don't try me. Um, and that was, um, the language camp had to stay in in one place for three months, so it was a little bit far away from from the front lines. Now and we this then was there in were... summer, right? Sorry, this was in summer. Yes, this was um, June, July, August, uh, two thousand sixteen. Um, there were Turkish um, fighter jets sometimes coming in our vicinity, but not really too close. And, but the fighters were very confident about, they said also there were drones now and then, but they yeah. said, we don't want the drones to define our lives here. So we take our precautions. Um, but it's also a psychological war and we don't want it to affect us too much. And then after that, I went to, 
many places where the PKK has a presence, for example, Mahmur camp, which is a camp in okay. Iraq, just outside the Kurdistan region where uh, Kurdish refugees from Turkey are, you know, building, building a life since the early 1990s. I went to Kirkuk, which was still um, in, in Kurdish hands at the time. And then I went to Rojava, also to Shengal in north, uh, northwest Iraq, where uh, the genocide against the Yazidis happened. And then I went to, um, to Rojava and um, we went walking by night across the border from, from Iraqi Kurdistan to Syrian Kurdistan. I've heard people really? do that. Oh, I'd wreck my ankles, my God, really. <laughs> oh. In the dark, because you have to go on a moonless yeah, night, yeah. you know, so it's yeah. pitch dark. And with every step, oh my God. But part of the story, of course. And I made, it, I made a stupid mistake because I made two mistakes. One mistake was that I didn't take a note. You have to take a note from the commander of the previous uh, place where you were. Yeah, yeah. And the note and the note says to the to the commander of the place where you arrive why you are there and what your task is. But I yeah. didn't have that because I've, I'm of course not a member. I'm somebody from outside. Yeah. So they said, "Oh, you came without a note." Some people, came, some fighters came to look at me like, "What? What did she do? She came without a note." Oh my God, she came without a note. <laughs> So I had to talk to some higher commander about what I was doing there. Yeah. And I made the stupid mistake of saying, I'm writing a book about the PKK. So that's uh, why I'm here. Yeah. And she said, well, you're in Syria now. There's no PKK in Syria. Yes, so it's going to be like a kind of reflection. <laughs> I thought, oh, shit, I made a mistake. And many, and many fighters the mountains in, in Kurdistan in Iraq knew me from my work in Turkey, but many YPJ and YPG fighters, YPG, the women's fighters, didn't really know me. So they thought like, oh my God, there's, you know, again, somebody who doesn't know shit. Yeah, there's like a very so big I had to really mutual... talk like I know the difference between PKK and YPG and I, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And eventually they said, okay, welcome. And, you know. Yeah, for so, people that don't know, there's like a very big gap in development in social stuff between Baku and, and Rojava. Even though like Rojava's main cities like are on the border of Turkey, the region is the poorest part of Kurdistan and kind of the most, I don't know, conservative part. Well, not conservative, but like it's a very like... Most Baku underdeveloped. Really... It's the most yeah. underdeveloped. It's truncated. It's like uh, it's pr very peripheral in a very it's peripheral region. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, it, it, um, the PKK has a has a history there. Islam was um, was there until well, he's been in a different place in the Middle East, but had this uh, main base in Syria since before the 1980 coup in Turkey. Um, and he was actually kicked out of Syria yesterday um, in 1998. Yeah. Which led to his to his arrest eventually in '99. Um, but Absolutely. yeah, maybe it's maybe it's good to say something about the difference between uh, PKK and YPJ because sometimes people say it's like very naive to think that they are not the same. And all oh, everybody knows there are fighters going from from the mountains in Kandil to Rojava and the other way around. Everybody knows that, don't deny it. And that is true, you know, I don't deny that, but that still doesn't make PKK and the YPJ the same. They have the yeah. same ideology and the same goal um, and the same leader, but their, um, their fight is different. In yeah. the PKK is fighting a guerrilla war in Turkey and it doesn't hold any territory and you know it's a guerrilla war while the ypj and ypg and later sdf the, the forces that cooperated with the americans they they defend a territory that is also administratively under kurdish um rule so they they defend their uh, they are like the legitimate armed force there yeah. Um, and they don't attack Turkey, 
Megan Baudet, I don't know if you know her, but she, she's an academic and she has um, meticulously checked every cross-border attacks between Turkey and Rojava. And it's like hundreds from Turkey to Rojava and like 30 the other way around in defense, or it's not even clear who actually shot, yeah. uh, shot the ammunition. So that's a very, um, that's, that's a big difference. And if yeah. you come from the PKK in, in the Kandu mountains and you have a task in Rojava, you take off your uniform. Uh, sometimes you even get a civilian task or you take, you wear another uniform and your task is not anymore to be a guerrilla fighter in Turkey. No, you're there to preserve the autonomy in, in Syria. Yeah. yeah. And things to say that obviously these groups are like structurally independent of each other, but for like a Kurdish person who supports these organizations, they aren't very concerned about which ones Western governments make illegal and which ones they don't. So you'll see people, the same people that fly YPG flags fly PKK flags, but that doesn't mean the two groups are the same. It yeah. means that they're part of a similar movement, which these yeah. people support together, regardless of what Western governments say about which one's legal and which one's illegal. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's an important mm. point to, to make. Obviously, uh, for our audience, you know, Turkey is a NATO member. It's part of the Western alliance system. It is a foundational, you know, uh, uh, linchpin of American power in the Middle East, power projection through the existence of the Inchilic base. It is a major communi uh, uh, a logistics hub for, for Israel as well. Uh, and um, so, as you might expect, the PKK is illegal both in the United States and in Europe. The YPG, which is organized, and I, and I think you made it quite clear, I think the there is overlap uh, between the PKK and the YPG in Syria, uh, you know, because for a number of different historical uh, reasons, uh, ideological reasons, but organizationally, the existence of nation states in the Middle East forced these forced these political parties to operate organizationally separate. And this is not the first time this kind of development has happened. In the 1940s, the Kurdistan Democratic Party, which is now the governing party of Iraq, was initially founded in Iran. Uh, there was a Soviet intervention and there was a, a Kurdish Republic declared. Uh, but over time, the exigencies of the different political circumstances facing Kurds in Iraq and the different political circumstances facing Kurds in Iran led to the creation of basically two PKKs, uh, which uh, which uh, initially had similar ideologies, but sort of evolved in different ways. In a similar dynamic is happening with the Syrian uh, Kurdish movement and the Turkish Kurdish movement, although probably the biggest difference is that there is a strong ideological glue that sticks the uh, uh, groups together, and that's focused around the figure of Abdullah Öcalan, who we've mentioned in passing. But just for the audience who are not aware, Abdullah Öcalan is the founder of the PKK. He was uh, he, he was its leader. Uh, as mentioned, he was operating in Syria for a long time with the support of the Syrian government. And then the Syrian government basically got intimidated by Turkey and forced uh, kicked him out in two thousand. Uh, uh, sorry, in in, in uh, nineteen ninety eight. He went on the run and eventually he was caught in Kenya uh, by Turkish forces with the help of Mossad and the CIA, right? And um, uh, and he's been in jail ever since. Originally, and, and uh, uh, Frederica pointed this out earlier, you know, originally the PKK was pretty much your like standard uh, third world Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, Crossbead uh, organization, highly authoritarian, highly centralized. Uh, highly controlled by the political leadership and the command councils. Since Ojalan's capture, Ojalan's ideological perspective has shifted and the organization uh, has shifted towards this ideology of democratic confederalism, which uh, reject. if you think of the, um, the Kurdish movement in Turkey, uh, originally under the PKK called for a, a united, independent and socialist Kurdistan, now as Frederica pointed out, it, there's a rejection of the nation state as a, as a model. So the question I would have for this with democratic confederalism, democratic confederalism places a lot of emphasis on decentralized governmental structures, decentralized political structures. 
how does that square with the highly hierarchical uh, tradition of the PKK in the 90s, right? How does that, how have they managed to, has there been a change? Are there still legacies of that uh, uh, top-down organization that existed in the in the 80s and 90s or has the revolution within the party and the organization changed well that's interesting because um you know when i wrote my book what what was one of the hard things was to make actually like how to cut this into different chapters <clears throat> because many the ideology is so tight it all Mm. Um, you know, th it's all so connected that you can't explain one thing without the other thing, you know. And it, it has it has uh, a lot to do also with uh, with women's liberation. You could say that they shifted from um, from focusing on Kurds as the most marginalized to women being the most marginalized. And they would say to me. Um, like you could say that the state is a man and the PKK is a woman. And I really liked, I really liked that. It's very clear because they said it, the, the state, the nation state is a patriarchal concept and it is tied to capitalism. The, the two can't do without each other. And when you look, for example, at in the Ottoman times when the Kurdish um, clan leaders were cooperating with the state. They are still doing that. They Together, they, they uh, keep the patriarchy in place and keep women suppressed. And they're still doing that. There are still Kurdish leaders in Turkey. Um, shall I say it out loud? Yeah, also in Kurdistan, in Iraq, who are cooperating with Erdogan to keep the patriarchy in place. Um, and if you want to break this, you have to break, eventually it's about breaking the patriarchy. And you have to do that also within your ranks. And you have to, the fighters also have to be aware of how, how patriarchy doesn't only work in, in state structures, but also in family structures and within themselves. And there's of course a lot of education in PKK, of, of course, I don't know if it's of course, but there is a lot of education. And what I found very interesting is that there is one course that men and women follow separately. And that is the course in which they try to break down the patriarchal structures that are within themselves. So that is a course that men and women take separately. Because if you want to break down patriarchy and see that as a point where you're going to, then men and women have a different route to take. And if you would do that in a, in a class together, then the patriarchal structures would repeat themselves and you wouldn't get anywhere. Um, and that is a, one of the important goals of, um, of men in the PKK, of their education, is to sort of, how they phrase it, like kill the men in themselves. Um, to, yeah, to get rid of the patriarchy. And that's very interesting to see. Um, also, once I was, sometimes you don't, uh, I talk about the daily life in the, in, in, uh, in the PKK. Sometimes I was, in, in war, there is of course a clear hierarchy, you know, who is leading the squad and who's giving the orders. Yeah. But in daily life, there is not. Sometimes I would come to a base and I, I wouldn't know, I couldn't figure out who the commander was. Because the commander's ta task would be, one of them explained it to me like, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to enable the fighters to develop themselves and to make sure they read and they discuss books and they, you know, look at themselves and do self-reflection, self-criticism, all these things. And I once talked to a male fighter and he was sort of, I found him a little bit macho. I didn't like the way he he was talking to me. Mm. And I said it. It's also an example of how I could really say anything there. I said, you know, you're being a little bit macho. I don't really like it. 
And he said, yeah, my, my comrades have pointed that out to me, that I have this in me and I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. But I'm the oldest son of the oldest son <laughs> of a Kurdish clan. So it's embedded so, in him. You know, I was, he was brought up as, as a prince. Yeah, and he yeah. joined rather young, like when he was 16, 17 or something. But he said, yeah, I know I have this in me and I'm, I'm working on it. It's all I can say. Yeah. So I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. You know? So that is, that is tied to the nation state. Like the nation state is the problem. It's a suppressive system. And they would always, and it's always funny that I bring it up too, because I, it, it, it sort of, I got tired of it. But they always bring up the Neolithic times, 10,000. Yes. 10,000 before Christ. And I would sometimes beg them like, no, let's stick to the last, you know, century or something. But no, let's quickly touch upon the Neolithic. You know, there's not that much known about it, but it was a more mat matriarchal society. Yeah. And it was more with more care for the community. Um, shown, for example, by not having one god, but a, a series of goddesses and you know so they say we need to get our inspiration from there there can be a more matriarchal society where people take care of each other and i i want to extend shortly on that too because it reminds me of something very beautiful that one fighter told me she had been in pkk for a long time and she was in her 50s we were talking about this at a camp in uh, in mahmoud camp in this refugee camp which was uh, protected by PKK bases, and I, and I asked like, how how do we know that? She said there is this seed in us from from uh, Neolithic times that is still in us, and we need to nurture it. I said, how would you, how would you know that you know from all these all these generations back that we still have this in us? And she said like, what do you see when you see that a that a Yazidi woman is, you know, sold on an ISIS market, or what do you see mm -hmm. when a child dies of hunger, or what do you feel? I said, yeah. you know, it's very disturbing, of course. It angers me and it saddens me. And she said, that's the seed. Yeah. And it's plain biology that, you know, that with every generation has the material from the previous generation. So that is the seed in us, and the patriarchy tries to kill it. And capitalism tries to kill it and the nation state tries to kill it but we have to nurture that seed and make that feeling um the basis of our struggle and that's so summed it up so beautifully and it was so clear you know so that's that's how you know imagine me trying to put that into different chapters i managed i think but it wasn't easy yeah <laughs> Yeah. So, so uh, Frederico, what do you see as the long-term vision of uh, the Kurdish movement? Also, we want to thank Landrew Landrew for the super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, what do you see as the long-term vision of the Kurdish movement? What is the what is the goal? Uh, and, and do you see it? One of the things whenever we, we uh, whenever I think about the Kurdish movement, I wonder: Are these one people who are in four different locations trying to chart out four different visions was there any kind of sense that there's a unified desire to create one long-term vision collectively as a people in other words is there a unitary vision of identity amongst kurds in various nation states and and what exactly is the long-term way in which they is there a, the capacity for a unified long-term vision are we are, are the visions fractured by the the reality of they are in they being in different actual localities yeah there there are differences mostly with uh between kurds in syria and turkey and kurds in uh iraq uh in iraq they had a referendum for independence in 2017 which was totally unrealistic but that that part of kurdistan is ruled by old clans, Barzani clan, which dates back to the 1940s, was what Jenna was talking about. They, they still rule in a very patriarchal way and cooperating with, um, with Erdogan to, to try to crush the PKK. Um, but, but as I 
earlier I zoomed out to also to Ottoman times, but I would also like to zoom out to the future. Is that possible? Yeah, why not? Um, because I was talking about that with fighters too, of course. And, and also because of my own perspective, when I was in, based in Diyarbakir part of that time, most of that time there was a sort of a peace process going on in Turkey. And I was already thinking like, what, what is it going to do to both Kurds and Turks if the, this matter is actually solved? How, how will it change identities? And I was thinking already of staying for one year, for example, in a very nationalist Turkish village on the Black Sea coast to see how, how, what kind of dynamics it would bring. But then the whole peace process crumbled and the war started again. And I talked about that with fighters and also said to them, like, this is what you're striving for, like, no nation states, um, no capitalism, no patriarchy. I mean, do you think this is going to happen in your lifetime? And they said, of course not. You know, very small chance. Um, but capitalism will fall. They were sure about that. They said it's not compatible with humanity. The planet is being destroyed. Um, you know, it's not compatible with, with humanity, with life. So it's going to crumble. And we need to be ready um, to have experienced and to have invested in an in a, um, alternative system so we can act when the time is right, which is the same what they did in Syria. Um, they were trying to put democratic confederalism in practice as much as they could in Turkey during the peace process. But then suddenly Assad withdrew his troops from the Kurdish regions in Syria and they thought, whoa, shit, that's an opportunity. So they have been building it there since 2012. And well, maybe, yeah, maybe, it will not, that, um... maybe it will not really survive um, eventually. You know, Assad is a dictator and he will want full control back. But it is an investment in, in, in educating people, in organizing people. And this fighter said, like, okay, maybe this is only going to happen in three, four generations. And maybe PKK doesn't exist anymore. Maybe some other organization has taken over or whatever. But it will happen. And we are investing in that now, which really made my perspective change. Like, oh, shit, I'm not going to report on peace in Turkey. I, also, my whole thinking about peace has changed. But I thought, hey, maybe in a couple of generations, capitalism is going to fall. Nation state is going to be obsolete and, you know, disappearing. And I am here now. And the founders of this movement are alive. And I'm yeah. talking to them. You know, what a time to be alive, isn't it? So I was like, okay, there's no peace, there's no justice, there's patriarchy, there's capitalism. And then I really understood the slogan that I always found a little bit cliche. Um, the hope is in the struggle. Yeah. And that's when I thought, my God, this is this has so this is really a very profound slogan, you know, it's not superficial, yeah. superficial and cliche at all it's very profound the hope is in the struggle and and that has really inspired me very much in my journalism as well it must have been really interesting to talk to central uh, command members like uh, jamil bayek who've been there like the whole time and there's also yeah. i think one yeah, of the but also but PKK. also very common fighters can say this too you know yeah and that's the and that's the nice thing about yeah. it yeah Jens muted himself. He muted. I have to look at the time because in like yes. 10 minutes, I have to go to meet friends to have dinner. Nice. Well, yes. So, uh, so we will begin wrapping up. Uh, one, one second. I need to turn on the light because before, you know, soon you're not going to see me anymore. One second. Uh, well, and while that's going on, I do think there's like something that's interesting that, um, I think we'd spoken a little bit about with you, Stefan, uh, even about yes. like the differences in the military processes. Mm -hmm. um, and what I find actually very interesting is that like the, as soon as Frederica starts talking about entering Rojava, your eyes light up because like you're the similar process 
yeah. you know, and like the United States military, each branch has those same type of things. Um, but the di- the different dynamic and especially the top down structure, you know, day to day, I would be, I would be playing like about education. So on how command educates you and your mind was just blowing. I saw your face. <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, that, that brings me to a kind of final question that I, I, I want to end on. And it's perhaps a little bit of a spicy question. And of course, uh, like everybody who watches the show already knows what my opinion on all this stuff is, but what is your response to the elements of the Western left who are very heavily critical of the uh, uh, the PKK and PKK adjacent movements, particularly the YPG, because of their military alliance with uh, the United States, what is what is what is your response to them uh, uh, about that particular issue? Because of course, there's a lot of people on the left in the West who support uh, uh, the YPG and the Rojava experiment. Uh, but, you know, there are certain uh, elements who are generally spend a lot of time defending Assad and saying that the, you know, Kurdish movement is just a pawn of American imperialism. What would be your response to that? <laughs> I was pretty my fingers in my ear. This Assad, oh, okay. Um, Kurds are trying to survive. And they are, um, they, they know um the structures of power very well they they know the turkish state better than the turkish state knows itself they know assad better than assad knows himself and they know the united states better than than it knows itself i mean um but they have to survive and they make alliances to to try to um to get um either recognition um, for their autonomy, or in that case, ISIS was banging on the door in Kobani. Um, so they were fighting a, a genocidal gang. Um, but it's also interesting when I talk about this with the fighters, they say um, the United States needed us more than we needed them. Mm. And I'm not sure if that's true, but it was a mutual need for sure, because the United States wanted some boots on the ground um, and nobody could deliver it but the Kurds. And they showed that, you know, it's not like, hey, you know, there's Kurds, shall we ask them? No, like, fuck, there are these Kurds, they're doing really well. So let's ask them, you know, so it's like a, it's a mutual thing, but it was it was a temporarily a temporary uh, deal um, and both sides knew it and eventually the United States will leave but preferably not like they left Afghanistan um, but if you if you look at it from the from the bigger perspective that I just also uh, outlined um, this is of course not just a concept for the Middle East, because they say you cannot carve out nation states in the Middle East because the diversity is so big, you will always create new minorities and new problems. So you will have to give people something to say about their lives on a very local level and respect and respect that diversity and celebrate it, actually, which is which is the same for the whole world. So in the end, um, they are investing in something that they hope will replace the capitalism and the imperialism that the United States is the symbol of. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, since you have to go meet some friends and have some dinner, this and- is my book. If you're looking uh, looking for it, that's what that's what I was going to say. I I do have a copy, and I've been reading it. And, and I the do Christmas like- song is also still still available. The boys are dead. I like the art on the front, by the way. I think yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the picture, cool. the picture on the front is really good. I'm kind of mad that Zero Books didn't get that book, but uh, maybe next time. Yeah, you did it with an Indian writer, communist very hard. publisher. Sorry, you did it with an Indian communist publisher. I saw. Yeah, Left Words in New Delhi. Yeah. There we go. But next time, Zero, I will. Uh, since now, I'm on the board. Okay. Okay. Deal. It's recorded. This is recorded, right? Yeah. This is, 
Uh, we hopefully will be having a fellow Dutch scholar, uh, a fellow, do we say Dutchman? Fellow Dutch person. Dutcherer. Um, um, uh, Michael Liesenberg will be writing for us soon too. Oh, very good. You're very lucky. You're very lucky. He is not only very smart and intellectual, but very kind. And he's, a very, he's, very he's, a very, he's a very good friend of mine, is Michael. So, so then you're going to have 100% men. Well, well, no, we will at zero books. We will have, uh, we will have. Um... No, I mean in that post in this podcast. <laughs> yeah, we, we we do work. We do work. You, the problem is, and I will say this quite open, is like you couldn't I, find them. No, it's because like, uh, firstly, it's like if, if because of the way that social media works, women get so much more abuse on social media. Like it's yeah. like um, it's unbelievable. If I if I was a a, a woman academic, I probably want to wouldn't want to do some of this stuff. Simply because, like, of the sheer, sheer threats and vitriol that pe people get on social media, it's a very, you know, and of course there are plenty of women uh, out there uh, who do social media, but it is kind of, it, it is kind of a, a, a very gendered dynamic, especially in the in the media space because of the level of abuse, which I'm sure you know, uh, you know, like threats of sexual violence towards uh, women yeah. in journalism yeah. and public sphere is like super common and it's it's probably quite intimidating but that is a discussion for another day i do hope you will come back and join us uh, uh one day in the future uh, anytime i like the conversation thanks very much for having me it's really nice well, it's appreciate real... you as well Farika. thank you for coming on thanks my pleasure totally okay Okay. Well, that was a uh, intro. You weren't expecting that one, were you? That was good. What's the. <laughs> Is it good? Funny that you like kind of shifted as you came into the screen as if the whole time you just hadn't been here. You just like walked out of the room and you just came back in now. <laughs> He was would, looking for coffee. He was looking for coffee. Would you get coffee. coffee and came back? You know what? No, I did not. Did you not get coffee? I haven't. I haven't even drank a glass of water. He was arguing with um, people in the chat. He's on a sweatshirt, though. I just very cold. It's cold for this beautiful beach town that I'm in right now. Something and um, which I don't know. You know, I'll have to definitely pick up the book right now that. Uh, and I, I, I get the news very late as far as guests come on, but <laughs> I, 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 but, I, st I hooked you in. Uh, my uh, you did. So you did. I, I, I want to say this. Hold I want to say this. Hold, hold on. on. Hey, I want to ask the question though. I have a feeling though, Frederica, and I want you know, like, I, I love that that the arc in and of itself of um, when she's describing coming into journalism and having the people warn her, don't. Don't be an activist. Don't be an activist. And it's almost like like solidarity is this. It's like you like you can't get close to the people. Don't get yeah. close to the people because like solidarity is that virus that you can't help but catch. And once you know, <laughs> it, once she was there, um, and I guess that's the question that I would have liked to have been able to ask before she had to go was like if if you could go back, would you would you put down the pen and paper and raise your fist? You know, is how much has this experience, you know, changed you, or is there just more to document? Um, I mean, I lots know. of the worries from journalists is that like journalism is like this specific legal thing which you can lose, you know, if you don't yeah. do these things properly. And obviously, she, I guess, I don't know if she did. Did Turkey like strip her of her journalist status before arresting her, or did they just arrest her? I'm, I'm not quite arrested. sure. She did. She they arrested her. She actually beat the case. She beat a case yeah, yeah. Again, against her. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think you guys you raised a really important point. A lot of journalism today is like access journalism, right? So you like you, you even kiss, on the left, even on the left, right? It becomes you kiss up to certain people, you pull your punches, so and you are like not necessarily like you have journalism which is just straight up lies and propaganda. But the more insidious form of journalism, which I think is the predominant form in the West, is the uh, omission journalism, mm -hmm. where you yeah. where you omit 
things. You're not lying about anything. You just pull your punches. And that is a, that's a far more insidious form of journalism in the sense that, uh, yeah, you do end up with this position where people are like, I'm not going to do this really important story because if I do it, this politician won't talk to me. Mm-hmm. This is the problem we see in cable news, right? This is why you don't have hard-hitting journalism in cable news. This is why the BBC sucks so much nowadays. And this is the problem that I think Frederica had to come to terms with when she came to Turkey. It's like, do you want to be in the, uh, what I like to call the Jahangir circle? Jahangir is like a fancy district in Istanbul, where do you want to hang out there with all the Westerners, having like long Turkish breakfasts, enjoying the Bosphorus views, and then occasionally taking a flight across the country uh, to do like some like meaningless 10 minute hit? Or do you actually want to get down and dirty and do some serious reporting? And frankly, the economic and political incentives are not orientated towards doing serious journal journalism. The, uh, the incentives are towards access and to sensationalism. And that is a universal problem on all wings of journalism. And so, you know, it's a pretty it's a pretty sucky situation. I may not agree with everything that Frederica says politically, but I, I respect that she does her, um, you know, she'd like, she does not this pseudo impartial journalism, but she reports honestly on what she sees. And everybody has a perspective. There's no... I'm there's no one is outside of the historical process. So the notion you can be totally impartial is an utter liberal delusion. Yeah. I well I think it's like kind of even a twofold thing of where one spending a year with any group of people is going to affect you in, you know, various ways. Um I spent but- five years with white people and I have a fondness for mayonnaise. <laughs> And my credit got better. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but uh, but but also too, if it gets tied into a struggle for liberation, that you know, and, and yeah, I have to say is legitimate. Um, then well, how does that affect whether you are, yeah, just a journalist or you believe in something greater? And how do you then, you know? act in a certain way that <laughs> I guess amplifies that cause, which, you know, is still, you know, how do you hold on to your journalism uh, accoutrement to just be able to deliver um, a message, something to be considered as well. Um, but it just seemed to me that, like, it, yeah, the experience was obviously, you know, uh, very impactful for Frederica and I'm sure Stefan, you may, you're here multiple times to attest to how powerful <laughs> it is. Um, I think the larger remember, question. The when I went to my question. first police interview after coming back to the UK, when the cop came in, I like stood up. So I was so used to like Kurdish military culture. I was like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> the question I wanted to ask is that does journalism has, does journalism, journalism have an, a charge to challenge uh, positions of authority. Well, you know, you know, is is that part of the actual obligation, or is that something that's aspirational? Um, or and and if it does, you know, who exactly will hold it to that task? When Burgess wrote in that latest book, canceling comedians, that whole truth to power thing is a bit overstated because power already knows the truth. So what are you really fucking doing at the, at that point? Like I, I really, I'm really starting to get over that whole. Oh, Chilan says something similar too. Oh, I really? What did he say? Um, I, I can find the quote. Give me a minute. The but people I think need to learn the truth of the people. The people need the truth. Exactly. I mean, I think yeah. this is this is an important thing. Uh, I think the truth to power is very much how liberal journalists like to perceive themselves. Right. It is. It is because you know ideology matters. Not everybody is like cynical uh, and hegemony is a real thing. Right. Yes. And I think, I think journal, like I think liberal journalists like to think that they're being responsible and saying truth to power. It's these words like res- being a responsible journalist. Right. Now on the left, the left journalism, we have, because there's no money in left journalism, we end up with like an opposite problem is where people just end up just repeating the same old slogans, but not actually providing concrete 
uh, reporting or, 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 yeah. or deep dives on things. So every article just becomes the same, you know, 10 slogans that people use over and over again. And ultimately, even if those slogans and those critiques are correct, it's uninteresting, right? Would you like to call that rhetorical wankery? That's a good one. That's a good English word, a good wank. So <laughs> the, the quote in kind of the, the opposite word, like starting with Foucault, Foucault said, the real po political task in a society such as ours to criticize the working of the institutions that appear to be both neutral and independent in such a way that the political violence has always existed there will be unmasked. So this is classic kind of idea of revealing, like very focused on revealing. Ochlan said, the ambiguous, unambiguous clarification of the status of power is only one aspect. Far more important is the question of liberation. In other words, the resolution of the problems exceeds the importance of revealing and analyzing them. I agree with the latter more than the former. Yeah, the latter yeah. is uh, Ochlan and the former is Foucault. Well, you know, I wasn't going to agree with Foucault on basically anything. <laughs> it's funny because Ochlan is a big Foucault fan. But Foucault, he doesn't think he, Foucault can fuck off. Far enough. <laughs> he can Foucault off. He so can what did Foucault you, off, dude. He can Foucault <laughs> off. Uh, uh, what's, uh, so what was your thoughts on the uh, on the discussion, Pascal? I'm, I'm curious to get your take. I, 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 I appreciated her, uh, her courage for being in a space that normally most Western journalists wouldn't take the time to really investigate the crux of the matters and the amount of dedication for over years that she's shown in being interested in the struggle of the Kurds, whether they be in the PKK or overall, um, is, is impressive to me. I respect her, her dedication to the subject matter. And uh, um, I, think, I think she had a very good, uh, very good analysis that uh, obviously is more, she's more informed than I am on 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 the subject i'm not an expert on on the curtis question by any stretch of the imagination and you know most of the stuff i've learned i've come as the, largely as a result of uh, knowing gene and my own readings of you know the politics of the muslim world and of course we know that there is a whole perception of the kurds that exists in there as well depending on what nation state that perception is coming from but um it's a complicated it's a complicated subject and uh, I think I appreciate the, the couple of shows that we've had that tried to look into it. And I actually appreciate one thing I appreciate is that we've gone beyond this discourse of like, oh, the, ter the courage or the tools of the imperialists, which I think is reductionist because it does not consider ter a Kurdish uh, agency and their need mm -hmm. or desire for autonomy mm -hmm. and sovereignty over their, all, their own affairs. That I think when we get stuck in this kind of, uh, you know, reductionist analysis of American imperialism. Just um, becomes really, really unhelpful. I think we've also made clear in both podcasts to reject kind of the Kurdish nationalist idea of that Kurds have always been oppressed, that things have mm. always been exactly the same, but rather to link Kurdish oppression, such that it is now, to specific historical developments. That at one point, Kurds were kind of this uh, kind of loyal tribal part of the Ottoman Empire, which only because of the transformation of the Ottoman Empire into Turkey that this whole situation emerged from. And obviously the thing by historically locating things, we can then actually see, oh, then maybe they can end too. Well, this mm -hmm. problem of kind of eternal oppression just kind of projects internal oppression into the future. Yeah, I think that's, I think this is one of the things I always uh, sort of think about is the comparison between some of the discourse in black politics in America and some of the Kurdish nationalist discourse around, you know, Kurdish oppression. And, you know, like when we look at history, for example, uh, the, major the majority of the violence meted out against the Kurdish population has been against the peasantry, right? Mm -hmm. And those are the people who are the most excluded from the political discourse. For example, in Iraq in 1988, there was the Amphal campaigns, which was a genocidal campaign, which, which we killed between, you know, 100,000 and 250,000 Kurds. Now, Kurdish intellectuals, there are many Kurdish intellectuals studying this, uh, uh, making money off this, like uh, things like that. But they don't come from the strata of the society which faced the brunt of that violence. And that was the people living in villages, right? In fact, you know, some of, some of the scholars who have done work on the Amphal genocide have like pissed off the villagers 
who they were doing, who they were using as a resource. So when Pascal talks about like, you know, the black middle class uh, living, dining out on, on, on black trauma, there's also a, a, a tendency among certain elements of the Kurdish political elite to dine out on the trauma of poor and working class people or people from the past when the majority of the violence and cost of the uh, 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 of uh, the wars against the Kurdish people has been borne by the, the the peasantry who are under the double oppression of the state and their own ruling class this is again something we need we need to always emphasize this class dynamic to uh, questions of colonialism and national liberation you go to a, a a place like Palestine. You know, we talk about Israeli settler colonials. Who was selling the land to the Israelis, right? Who was doing the selling? It was Arabs, right? It was absentee landlord Arabs who were send, selling land to Jewish settlers. I'm not making a case for or against anything at this uh, this point. My point is that like we have to look at the internal class dynamics within all so-called oppressed groups because there are often people who either, uh, who some of them like make careers, at, like in Kurdish studies today, like I was talking to someone about this. I was like, you know, like all these Kurds in the West are like talk, they're adopting all these pa paradigms like indigenous studies and like blah, -de blah, -de blah, like all these kind of woke languages and applying it to the uh, uh, Kurdish question, which annoys me because it always obfuscates the important class divisions because there's always been an intermediary class. One thing Frederica didn't mention is from the 1940s onward in Kurdistan, the the, the gendarmerie of the uh, Turkish state was the Kurdish feudal classes. The reason the PKK is a left-wing organization, the reason Kurdish nationalism took a left-wing slant in Turkey was because of the very specific class relations that existed in that country and the integration of the Kurdish feudal classes into the structures of power of the Stur Turkish state. So, you know, like... Uh, when we talk about black politics in America, when we talk about Kurdish question, when we talk about any of these uh, questions of national oppression or, or racial exclusion, we always have to bring we, we always have to bring in the class dynamic and resist those people who who attempt to basically accuse you of class reductionism and not okay. caring uh, 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 about. About um, the specter of racism. Or, or, yeah, or, 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 you know, you don't have to fucking tell me that people are racist towards Kurds in the Middle East. You don't have to tell Pascal that, like, at, like there are people who don't like black people and are racist to black people, right? Yeah. It's fucking condescending. I mean, we had that. We were on it. We were on a show, and that that was actually actually brought up. Was is is a uh, race and class one and the same? And it was kind of, um, I shouldn't say kind of. It was it kind of incensed me to ask that question because I thought it was silly. Mm -hmm. You know, my first response is, you know, I, Oprah and I have nothing in common. Barack Obama and I have nothing in common. Like, why, why would you think that the race experience, it, <laughs> all black people are the same? It, we're in just the States or in Canada too. <laughs> in Britain. Yeah, and Britain too. It's, it's very, very different existence. Yeah, I mean Pascal, who is uh, Haitian American, would you say <laughs> that? Of course, is a different existence. Haitian, Haitian. I'm, I'm going to actually even complicate that. I think the notion that there's one collective Haitian identity is actually wrong, even in Haitian society. For example, this notion that all Haitians practice voodoo and eat XYZ food is totally, absolutely nonsense. It's, it's a ridiculous stereotype. You know, there are Haitians that are evangelical Christians. There are Haitians that are devout Catholics. The fact that the belief that all Haitians speak French or not, there's some, I mean, the super minority of the country actually speak and can read and write in France. Most of them speak Creole, which is the, uh, you know, the, uh, the patois of the, of, the, of the land. And I think that those kind of complications exist in all societies. And I think that part of the consequences of being a quote unquote oppressed or minority group is that there's a, an assumption, there's an essentialized nature to that identity that renders it and facilitates the oppression. And that's a problem because it also obscures the complicated nature of those groups and how those internal stratifications may be used either by people outside those groups to facilitate the oppression 
Mm -hmm. or to internally actually facilitate the oppression as well. I really, one of the reasons I, I enjoy talking to Gene so much is that one of the fascinating kind of parts of the conversations that we have is juxtaposing our experiences coming from not only the, you know, parts of the Muslim world, but him being a Kurd, me being a black and also being Haitian and talking about how the internal stratifications of all of those varying identities help facilitate not only oppression of the, the lesser classes of those people, but also how people just confuse and understanding how there are internal conflicts in these groups that facilitate the problem. I mean, I one of the things that uh, I was talking to Gene about, and I shared it with him, and I think I shared it with, I think put it on my social media, is that, you know, on the Haitian question is that one of the things that we have to understand, and, and I try to do, do this, is that Haiti is a country where there's there, there was a, a fracture in the, unitary, in the unitary notion of a vision between two classes of elite Black people. Some were elite Blacks and some were elite biracial, or what we call mulattoes. And the, 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 the mulatto elite generally did not want to believe in the Black nation-state paradigm. That's a reality. And that had that the, most people don't know that for the first 20 years of Haitian Civil War, after the assassination of, 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 of Dessalines, the country was literally in a race, class, geographic civil war between the yeah. North and the South. So these kind of stratifications have consequences. And I don't think it's, it's idiosyncratic to, to Haitian identity. You see mm-hmm. that in all types of you know, peoples who are battling over internal conflicts amongst themselves to try to find a way to rationalize or ration out what the vision is. But one of the things, and I like talking to Gene about this as well, because he's a specialist in the nation state question. And this is where I actually kind of find a, a lot of value in our an- anarchist comrades is that why is it that the nation state project always renders that project to the perspective of elites? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's the nation state project is a state project, right? And states have elites, right? And uh, this is kind of like the inevitable sort of outcome of the partition of the world into these different nation states, you know, because the, 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 it's, it's not random why nation states exist, but they are fundamentally arbitrary, right? You know, people talk about there's no such thing as a natural border, right, between two countries, like by definition, a border is something that people have made. So you know these these things are on in a constant process of negotiation and uh, you know o- o- ongoing. One of the you know there are objective aspects to culture that link people together for sure, but you know these things can change and what unites people uh, can be different in different circumstances. You know, like the most widely spoken language amongst Kurds today is Turkish, right? Yeah. Mm. Right, the most widely spoken uh, language that that hasn't annihilated the Kurdish community. So you can't reduce Kurdish identity to language, but yet language is very important. So yeah. you know, like all these kind of cultural artifacts that make a nation are always in kind of flux uh, with one another. And the, you know, the nation state, the the nation is the kind of ideological construct that the state uses to legitimize itself. You know, we don't live in an age of kings anymore. We're not saying that God made you, like God God didn't make Pascal the king of Haiti. Even the most reactionary hierarchical maybe. state, in, maybe, maybe did, even the most reactionary hierarchical state in the world will say that it's ruling in the name of the people. So the question comes down, who are the people, right? And then this is where nationality comes in because you create a people. You look at American history, it's been a long negotiation of who is part of the American nation and who is not part of the American nation. And this is an ongoing forever process because nationality and identity are ultimately ultimately kaleidoscopic. People change their identities over time. People think, think, feel things in different ways at different times. And there are different circumstances that shape people. So like, you know, it's a... It's it, it's it's a tough one, but uh, it's a- and I, well, I think like even tying this stuff to some of the stuff of like issues with with journalism is asking like, um, within the United States, the diaspora of 
list any of the nations um you know like because my family is jamaican but also it's like partially because my mom's Dude. dad was from a, well had a, had a job within the prime minister's office mm-hmm. you know that gave my family an access that if my dad wasn't married to my mom his ass would have never got the opportunity to come um and so but also too if they've been here worked within you know uh the united states like how does that shape their viewpoint and and their ability to actually speak on behalf of jamaicans you know um in which case you can take that and 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 yeah overlap it with any type of uh national national identity um but it really comes down to going back to yeah frederica and it just saying i need to go to the people and share their story um, and so regardless if it's in Rojava or, you know, <laughs> or in Kingston or wherever, you know, these things, these dynamics can, have, you know, can change. But you're never going to know what is going on unless you're actually talking to the people who are experiencing it and not just these elite groups that usually have the mouthpieces of, you know, a lot of the media institutions. Pascal mentioned civil war and people will talk about the Kurds, but right now, like, the Kurdish organizations are, are quite close to kind of civil war. I don't think really close, but KDP, like the kind of oil, like faction, you know, like the elite, whatever, they've been pressing on PKK very, very heavily in collaboration with the Turkish state, not actively killing, but like occupying positions. So to press the PKK into a certain area where the Turkish Turks state can attack. And they've also been trying to enter Shingal, uh, the Z- Yazidi area that, um, Frederica mentioned, and obviously the people there have been resisting this move, but also the Yepige, Yepige commanders have said that if Kedepe occupies Shengal, then Yepige will do a cross-border operation in Shengal, like they did in 2014 to kick out ISIS. And so the yeah, tensions are very, very, very big within these, between these, between the Kurdish nationalist movement and the Kurdish liberation movement. And so talking about like Kurds is, is a really ridiculous thing. Did, Jen, did you see that Macron met with like the Kedepe's like fake women, women fighters? Yeah, I know. It's so, it's so <laughs> freaking ridiculous. So like, just so people know, the Iraqi Kurdish movement, right, is like very conservative for a whole bunch of historical reasons. It originally has some linkages with the Soviet Union back in the 40s, but it's become like a pretty, and ironically, the reason it's called the Kurdistan Democratic Party is because they adhered to Stalinist doctrine on socialism so they believed Kurdistan had to have a national democratic revolution before they could achieve socialism so when you see that's the reason like uh, North Korea is called the democratic uh, it has dem- because it de- hasn't had the full bourgeois democratic revolution to build socialism so that's why it's not a people's republic but that's a side point but they are very conservative uh, they're very conservative in terms of not like not super religious but very like you know, they, they modeled themselves like the simplest way to say it is they used to like have an advertising campaign called the the new Dubai, right? So they want to like emulate the success of the the Khaliji uh, Gulf Arabs. And uh, the KRG is like dominated by these guys. Uh, and their success is based on their cooperation with Turkey. So my opinion on the KRG is that the KRG is fundamentally a collaborationist institution which yes works in the interests of like works for in a loose sense iraqi kurdish in- interest but several at, hundred of them at least at least several hundred iraqi kurdish le- interests uh and uh, at the expense of kurdish movements in other parts of kurdistan because it's a, they get deployed against other kurdish movements uh, so, you know, like when people, I was at a conference recently when people were like, I, we're working for Kurdish unity. I'm like, there's no, no ideological and structural basis for Kurdish unity because yeah. like, different groups of Kurds have different interests. If you're an Iraqi Kurdish elite, it's a good time. They have KFC, they have KFC in Ar- Erbil. You can fly to Cyprus and have sex with all kinds of prostitutes at a casino. Like what's not to like about that, right? You can get hair plugs in Turkey, very nice hair plugs. So like for a certain sector of the Iraqi Kurdish elite, it's the best thing. Uh, but like, if you're like poor and working class, it's kind of like, it's kind of, it's like, it's not as bad as Saddam, 
because at least there's some development and at least you're not getting randomly murdered, but it's still not great. And for the new generation who wasn't brought up under Sand, it's Saddam saying how bad Saddam was is totally uh, irrelevant. So you have all these like class dynamics. And it's, it's again, to take it back to black politics in America, one of the problems that like many people have when they view black politics in America is that they don't, they don't see the class divisions in uh, black society. And again, when people look at the Kurdish question, they look at the Kurds as a unitary actor when they're not. When I went back to um, Kurdish Iraq after being in Rojava, uh, we got eventually a chance to leave the safe house and go to like a mall. And I was really excited just because, you know, we hadn't been to like a, a shop or any kind of like pseudo Western thing in ages. So we were all really excited to go and we went there and I hated it. <laughs> I just absolutely hated it. it. It was like, I think it was like eating something re like really, really sweet after you haven't had anything sweet in a while. I was just looking around this place, just like shell shocked, basically confused. We must've looked like a real sight because there's like six Westerners all kind of like pale and, and drawn and really skinny and like a bit war shocked or whatever, just kind of wandering around this mall. Like we didn't buy anything. We just left. That's crazy. Well, yeah, like I don't like going to the mall anyway. Do you like going to the mall? We have a we have a shopping center in Hull called Princess Key, which uh, which used to be the place to hang out. But malls are kind of dead now. It was like a it was like the big place to go hang out with people in the nineties. You'd go up to Leonardo's Cafe on the top deck of Princess Key, get some tie dye T shirts, get some incense, get some death metal records and then uh, go home but like now it all feels very sad and like consumerism has lost its luster my uh my local mall, mall when i was a youth had a roller coaster in it oh. wait is that was that metro center metro yeah metro center metro land yeah yeah metro i i i've, I've been to the biggest mall in north america okay. is the mall of america that's the biggest mall in the continental U.S. The biggest mall in North America is in Edmonton. Uh, mm -hmm. Same go. same people designed it. It's like redundant stores. We're gonna have to talk about Metro Center, Stefan, at some point because, like, there was no. It's, a place. it's it's one of the oldest in the country. And when yeah. I first saw it, I think it was like. I went on holiday with my family to Scotland in 1990 or 1991. And yeah. when I, I was like a kid and I saw this place, Metro Center, I was like, what is this place? What is this roller coaster? Utopia. Yeah, it was like Utopia blew my mind. But like, I guess I'm kind of bored of that now. I saw like the video where they were making it and like the BBC reporter from London described the area it was being built on, which is a relatively normal part of the Northeast, a wasteland. Jeez. Well, we have a question before we wrap up. A uh, question to Gene. What is the general opinion on Kurdish, Turkish? Oh, I can't read it. Celebrities, like, celebrities, Ibrahim, celebrities Ibrahim. like Ibrahim Tatlisis. Ibrahim Tatlisis, he, like he got shot, right? Like he was, right. a, he's like, so Kurds occupy a cultural position in Turkey not dissimilar to the position uh, black people hold in the United States in that the music and entertainment uh, uh, industry is disproportionately dominated by Kurdish singers and things like that. Um, with Ibrahim Tatla says, like, people like his music. Like, he did, like, a lot of music, but I think there's a lot more... Uh, people have some issues with his personal, uh, his personal behavior. Uh, he's like a kind of gangster kind of guy. So some people, like a lot of the Kurdish celebrities in Turkey, like don't get really political. So like more political Kurds are kind of critical of them, but like their cultural products, like people like them, you know, and it's not just Kurds that like them, like Turks like them as too. One of the most like uh, Orwellian things that happened during the Turkish invasion of uh, Afrin, which uh, in Syria was that like had, they had a war song, which was like literally a Kurdish song that like they got all the Turkish singers to sing, and they did like oh. a, it was like it, it was like a, like imagine they, they they like put all the black people in a in, in a in a plantation, reinstituted slavery, but did it to the theme of uh, DMX music 
being sung, <laughs> being sung by Taylor Swift. Oh wow! That's what. That's what. Like that's that. That that was the feeling. That was the. Feeling I think I'm gonna puke. Yeah, oh. imagine that. Like that was basically what was going on in in there. They, the, like, can Taylor someone Swift. that's watching this show <laughs> make that? If you are real, <clears throat> and you make that just a picture or a meme because i need that in my life oh, wow you i need, need a that meme for the show you need a meme like we've what? pushed some buttons on this show to the point where i've had like phone calls from my mom i don't was that when was that when you did the uh the harriet tubman uh harriet american, tubman Ex on american the express Amex black card <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah 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 <laughs> that was good <laughs> um so uh, i'd say as 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 a resident meme maker like i don't like don't don't if you're white do not make that meme if don't make black, black people in the salvation <laughs> plantation with dmx but dmx is kind of swift yeah, yeah, yeah. So right now, what I'm thinking in my head, Taylor Swift, she's kind of on a, like a like a upraised podium type of thing, you know. Um, Singing X the, give the it microphone, to the microphone it. is kind of like a whip shit, you know, like <laughs> like, a, like it's it's very similar to a whip, you know, and and it, like I'm the X gonna give it to you, but like you know, Massa gonna give it to you, something like that, oh, <laughs> you know. I, that's that's what I've got going in my head, Pascal. I I apologize, Gene, Gene, Gene like, and Jason are going to blame for this. <laughs> um, look, look, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this this little bit of notoriety we get from this show, someone will please bless us with that meme. Put I it in my inbox. Booking at thisisrevolutionpodcast dot com. If you want to email it to me. <laughs> That would be. It's going to be the show background for the next oh, episode. It, for the foot, hey, look, real talk. If you don't want to say who you are, who does it? Because I know whoever does it doesn't want to say who they are. This, this <laughs> the climate right now is real hot for people to be mad at you for <laughs> some shit like that. I will make that the background for whatever show we have for a week. I don't care what we're talking about. Ooh. Oh God, damn. We're gonna be talking about birth control in China, and that's gonna be the backdrop of that show. <laughs> Wait, birth control in China or both birth control in China? Uh, both. So it's like this. Okay. <laughs> birth control in China. Well, I mean, it's obviously like a big this. thing with the one child policy, or whatever. You know, that could have been a show. There, yeah, we, no, we do. We do have a. We do have a. We're gonna be doing that this Thursday, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna have to do the Brexit show so, at some point, Stefan. We're gonna have Sorry. to. We're gonna have to bring. Pascal's been wanting to do a Brexit show for a while. True indeed. Wait, true indeed. You have to get a Remainer. Oh God, no, no, no. Who's the most? Who's the most ultra Remainer in England at the moment? Um, who's the king uh, of the Remainers? There was, some, there was some guy who just went up to a cabinet minister and gave him like, well, like fake billions of rubles to reward him for doing Brexit or whatever. They're still just absolutely demented. The whole country is demented. It's it's become it's yeah. become like it's become like. Uh, but, but soon the lights will go out here, and you don't have to worry about us. You won't hear from me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and what's with all this turf yeah. stuff in in Britain? Everyone's calling Britain Turf Island. Is that a real thing? Yeah. Um, I was hearing that like four years ago. It's oh, interesting. Yeah. I think there's like a. It's not still like in academia or whatever. I mean, there's this one woman. Um, the one from Essex. The one Sussex. from. New Sussex, yeah. Sussex, mate. Check yourself. Um, but it's just kind of, yeah, like, I guess there's like a, a small, I think it's maybe because um, kind of like second wave feminists in the UK became like quite elite and onto like into journalistic things and to senior newspapers. Um, and, and then kind of there's just a relatively small clique of, of, of TERFs or women who care about this stuff or whatever. Who yeah, just post lots of like like really in demented, like insane stuff. Like after this male cis policeman murdered someone, the Guardian said an article where it's like, oh blah, 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 blah. Murdered a woman, by the way. Like it's actually murdered her, like that kind of thing. 
uh, blah, 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 in this article. And at the end, it's like, oh, we need to make sure that there's like biological women only spaces where trans people aren't in. It's like. What does that have to do with anything? Yeah, that was like the conclusion to the article. It's like. It wasn't there like a labor labor party member that like had like gotten some type of you know i don't know slap on the wrist or or some shit yeah, like she's, that she's or... about to defect and join the conservative party they've already offered it to her uh so she's gonna leave soon yeah is there just a big up swing in uh trans i mean not not like right? among people not among, no, like, among... it's people. like it's and obviously it's... like i don't know what the divide is in the u.s if there is one but obviously women are much more sympathetic to trans people in all polls than than men are so the idea that kind of these senior journalists or whatever or labor politicians or whoever are like kind of representing the will of british women is, isn't true at all they're much more they're much more kind of expressing the will of uh, british men than british women is jermaine scria still on the fucking bbc all the time because i'm so sick or is she being can is she dead now i don't know like i've been out uh, of i don't think but she's not i don't think she was ever like a proper turf i think she she never got oh, she, into that i don't think oh she didn't go full turf on us but okay fair enough T Turtle Island. Oh well, you know it is. A, Some, it is a someone thing. said they were watching the Michael Albert episode as a fellow OG. If oh, really? if you guys want to see something, I think is pretty funny is us explaining what an OG is to Michael Albert at the end of the first hour, and then <laughs> and then us explaining Afro, having him wrap his mind around Afro pessimism in the second hour is pretty awesome. So you just abused his pure mind. You his pure his mind was... A lot of foreign concepts. He was like, but why would anyone believe this? <laughs> Still a valid question to me. <laughs> Pascal, Pascal blew his mind. You should have, his face was like, what? <laughs> what is this? No, that Michael Albert episode could have gone for hours. We have to have Michael Albert back to talk about Venezuela, actually. Since he was there all the time, that was like, Venezuela. yeah, like if you want to see a good show, become a patron and check out that two hour epic we did on Thursday night because it was like super interesting. No, it was three hours because oh. it was one hour uh, in the main show and two hours. So we had a three hour conversation with Michael Albert about participatory, I said it this time, economics. Yeah, it, it, was, it was it was beyond someone saying Greg Tate. It was beyond the Greg Tate conversation because you know Greg Tate had a grasp of what it was, and you know he's gone on to write a very since he's been on our show for some reason he went on to write a very long piece in the Nation about his love <laughs> for the the doom and gloom of Afro pessimism. Uh, <laughs> I think me personally, I think that was uh, a journalist rap battle. Shout out to Pascal. I think he's trying to ether Pascal. Pascal destroyed in the nation. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had to clap back. Man, listen, I will be it's addressing so all of this in the soon, very soon. I thought this was the anti drama podcast. No, not uh, drama. I don't know. No, not, I mean, listen, I'm not. So, I I don't have any drama. I think I think Greg was a great guest. I enjoyed his, his perform his appearance on the show. But, you know, we kind of push back about Afro-pessimism because, you know, yeah. generally we don't believe it. And we're not the only ones who don't. There are lots of people with varying politics who find it problematic. But uh, it's just become the popular default uh, explanation of people's worldviews nowadays. And I think it's, it's a product of a, a more distinct trend that we always talk about, about within the 50-year counter-revolution of how doubling down on a certain type of race reductionist trauma is really about getting concessions for the working class or quote unquote, the fat back and biscuits and the recognition, you know, popularity. And I don't understand how someone like David Brooks giving a shout out to Afro pessimism and reparations is any more of a sign that the stat that the status quo is down with it that we need to realize. No, I've seen American leftists uh, like they. No, he's not a leftist at all. He's a right wing New York yeah, Times editorialist. Right. I'm I'm yeah. seeing that American leftists are like getting into defending the British Empire. In like <laughs> saying, <laughs> oh, G Gerald Horn is doing that. Gerald Horn is. The, doing they, it. they say that kind of the 1789 revolution was like a 
the slave oh, revolution. Oh, you're talking about the uh, counter revolution of uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a bunch, there is a bunch of people on, on Twitter doing that. Uh, and it's based on Gerald Horn's thing. Gerald Horn wrote that. Well, place. I mean, wasn't the British Empire giving people their freedom papers? That was only because they wanted to undermine the the American Revolutionary War. No, I understand. Yeah. Still, people I think people talk the about the British, British Empire abolishing about. the slave trade, but the U.S. abolished the slave trade in the same year the British Empire did. So I don't really know what right. the advantage would have been, because obviously, and people don't realize that after the revolution, the USA was completely aligned with British policy for decades and decades and decades. Yeah, particularly around sabotaging the French. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, bad, bad America, bad, bad, bad. British Empire, not very good, I can tell you. Yeah, like oh, whoa. Americans don't defend it. That's very weird. Yeah, oh. British Empire, British Empire is pretty like because there's a weird like I don't know if it's still a thing, but definitely when I was still growing up, there was a kind of still a kind of weird pride about the British Empire. We built railways in India, and it's like, and the okay. GDP didn't grow for two hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> They were magic. Would railways. you would you say though? Would you really say Gerald Horn's book is a defense though of the British Empire's project, or would you say this is his observation on a situation? I think it's. I think he's trying to make the statement that the you know, the founding of America is inextricably tied to their desire to maintain slavery, and I think that one of the ways that that's being refuted by some people, and I'm I'm not trying to get into a debate. I respect Gerald Horn. He wrote a couple of books that I found very, very, very impressive. But with that argument is that after the Revolutionary War, several states that had slavery ended slavery, and particularly in the North. You got to remember, New York used to have slaves. They used to have slaves throughout the Northeast. Many of those states immediately before and after ended slavery. So the question becomes that if slavery was such a motive for the U.S. Revolutionary War, why did so many states end the practice instead of proliferating it when only half of the 13 colonies, even less than that, maintained the practice of slavery up until that point. So I think that's what some people are saying that it doesn't really make sense in terms of the overall, I'm not getting into a debate whether I don't, I'm not qualified to say whether Gerald Horn is right or wrong. I just see that there's a debate back and forth and people are evaluating. I mean, I get, I've read, you know, the guy's written some books that I find valuable, but you know, I can understand why there's shaky ground in that argument about the counter revolutionary war of counter counter revolution of 1776, it's probably much more useful to view why the British Empire got rid of slavery in Canada was it just wasn't really that macro economically useful. Or oh, also has to do with the fact that that Wilberforce had family members that were killed in the Haitian Revolution, and the British actually had one of their major military losses of 15, 50, 000 soldiers in those campaigns because they tried to retake the island as well. I mean, let's not let's not mention the fact that the British may have stopped importation of slaves, consequence to that as well. But they still maintained slavery up till 1838, and that was also they only stopped it in 1838 because it was a massive slave rebellion in Jamaica that mm-hmm. killed quite a few Brits as well. So I and think the larger the larger they compensated question compensated the slave owners, and they compensated the slave owners too. They did, they did, they did. Oh yeah, they stuffed their mouths of gold. Yeah, so as were the French compensated. But. Well, William Wilberforce actually. Went to my high school. The fact that you have a high school, high school that school. old is pretty interesting, Gene. Yeah. And we 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 even have a house there called Wilberforce. I was not in Wilberforce. We had three houses, four houses: Wilberforce, G, Marvell, and Alcock. And I was in Alcock. <laughs> That's an interesting name. <laughs> it's, it's, so, of course, I'm you were the Essex thing. I'm talking about Jen <laughs> secretly <laughs> posh. <laughs> I, I I am secretly but I'm not secretly posh. I uh I, I'm I'm, not, I'm for Hull, I'm very I'm like very elite for Hull. Yeah. In your, I went to Catholic uh, school, so legally none of our schools can be any older than eight years old. Yeah, well no, my my, my school was what, six hundred years old? Yeah. So you went to schools that are older than the American Republic? Yep. <laughs> My school got burnt down during the uh, English Civil War. Oh, wow. wow, nice. Um, these are, these are but have you ever seen that in all cock? I, I, I was in. It's like Gryffindor, but bigger. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. I hate you, Jesus. Um, it's more like Slytherin, baby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Damn. 
That's some. I've um, never read. I've never read Harry Potter. I only know like I only know it from the merch. What's the other have, houses? Have any of y'all uh, seen the the, the U.S. patriotism takes? Huh? The, the, the U.S. patriotic socialism. Well, uh, oh, Caleb you mean Malcolm. you mean the Nationalist Socialist Project? <laughs> This, this is the that organizer would be, that would be Nazis, would it not? <laughs> Last I checked. I mean, to be honest, I think it's lots of people arguing about something that they more or less agree about. Is this something that comes out of like ultra leftism, ultra leftism, or something? Uh, it comes out of like I mean, uh, post leftism. Excuse me, post leftism. No. Oh, it comes out of like um, hot, hot it's, take it's more... podcast fear. I think <laughs> it's it's no, it's it's kind of more like a they're like. They're like Marxist Leninists, they're not post leftists, but they're kind of a bit too like I don't know, they like you know, you know Lenin's uh speech or paper like uh, in praise of the great Russian people. Mm -hmm. They take that they seriously. Think, they think that the kind of idea that, you know, and it's not a completely insane idea, is that kind of any socialist movement is gonna have to be in some sense patriotic in the sense that it wants to improve people's lives. Uh, and it wants to be like in working with people, with the people's desires, with people's interests and so on. But obviously in the US, which is both like um, highly kind of like racialized and divided society, as well as like the world's premier leading imperialist power. I think to do this, you obviously that you have to do it in some way, but you have to be more careful than I think these people are being. And a lot of it ends up being like tailism, which is, you know, the idea where you just kind of support whatever the people happen to support. Yeah, it's like it's blue car, blue collar fetishism, and uh, yeah, like that might work when you that kind of like social uh, uh, posture might work if you're in like I don't know Nepal or somewhere like that. But yeah, it's risky in America, you know. But I, I think the worst problem really is the the complete kind of like haters that completely hate their own country in every single way and can't see a single thing positive in it. Like people like in in Britain, like. When England was playing Croatia, people were supporting like leftists were supporting Croatia, one of the like most famously fascist fascist countries <laughs> just because it's anti England. Well, Pascal was bringing Pascal and Jean were talking about this the other day. I don't know why Stefan isn't in on our 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 chats that we have our chat group. I think he would. I, I don't uh, want to be groomed on Discord. <laughs> <laughs> Jason's trying to groom Stefan. <laughs> oh man, no. He well, I mean, I think that one of the things that for me is that the the patriotism project, whether for, for all nation states, not to sound like I'm being influenced by my anarchist comrades, I think that we should actually just challenge that that concept overall, because since we all we already acknowledge that the nation state project is tied to a kind of elite. Uh, ca a project overall, I think that patriotism becomes a way of really just having, you know, the masses, the proletariat, if you will, just surrender to a project that ultimately is not about their better interests. You know, I've, I've come to a position where I kind of question all kinds of nationalism, Haitian nationalism, black nationalism, uh, and patriotism as well, because I think that I feel that those projects overall are really not about the majority of the people who are the least of those in those societies. And I, I wonder though what the utility would be of like the, I guess, more communal identity and even like Stefan, uh, when you're met, I forget what union you were, you'd mentioned, but you'd said that pretty much it was like this oh, unionized right. effort to deliver <laughs> actual like programs that like, whether it's healthcare, yeah, like, or, you know, this is before the second world war where kind of the, uh, where the British social state was founded, the National Unions of Miners in, in Durham, especially, um, mm -hmm. they formed their own social state, basically, with healthcare, with all people's homes, with everything like this. Um, they even have, which is now like a gradient listed building, um, they had a miners parliament, where a representative from each pit would go there. And to a large degree, probably more than like a local council, they dictated the affairs of these areas. And this continued then after the war it became like a collaborative part of like in in combination with the british social state of the labor party and so on and then eventually with thatcherism and neoliberalism this thing was destroyed um but yeah that's and this is this strategy to be clear like kind of isn't against electoralism or isn't with electoralism but it's another thing you can do 
and um yeah i guess it would like order like if if it would be a better strategy of like pennsylvania and being associated with steel you know or yeah. uh coal miners and in, in, in appalachia um there's a there's more regional identities that you could have that's not necessarily tied to an imperialist fucking country that's yeah. uh well, it also depends on what you mean by patriotic, right? Like, uh, it's like, w- there's an issue about, like, respecting cult- culture. Like, don't shit on people for watching football games. Don't shit on people for, like, liking cultural uh, uh, country music. You know, like, don't be like, barbecues are fascism. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> like Thanksgiving is fascism. Thanksgiving is like, it's fascism. It's like, you know, don't do those kind of useless, like, pointless cultural war battles my conception like when people go like oh gene you're like not very patriotic to england or something like i was like i like loads of things like in about england i like pubs i like going down i like going down to pub i like fish and chips i like i like uh carry on movies uh you know um, uh, i like a lot benny of hill love benny hill i don't i do i never watch benny hill i i now no, carry on movies Carry on movies is the freaking. Well, don't you like Doctor Who? Yeah, it's okay. I don't like this new Doctor Who. It's all woke. No, I'm joking. (laughs) (laughs) It's a gal. It's a gal. (laughs) Doctor Who is a Doctor Who is a time lord. He must have a penis. (laughs) It's canon. You know, it's like it's like come on, nerds. It's like. It's like all the nerds get upset about like the new Star Trek too. It's like Star Trek's got woke. It's like. Like, have you watched Star Trek? Like, the whole subtext of Star Trek The Next Generation is that they are, like, regularly having orgies on the Enterprise. First like, that's... interracial kiss on US TV. First interracial kiss. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. yeah. That's super woke. That's yeah. so woke oh. that they would have fucking burned you in 1950 for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, people are going, like, the reason the new Star Trek is bad is not because it's woke. It's because it's, like, not that good. It's... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, Star Trek is like they literally live in communism. Like, yeah, they literally yeah. live in communism, and they, I swear they always have. It's like on Deep Space Nine, they're fucking like all the time. <laughs> you, know, I don't know how we got into this diversion and digression. Like, oh. I think, I'm yeah, I think this is something to do with socialist patriotism. <laughs> this is socialist patriotism. Yeah, yeah, this. Is. Socialist yeah, patriotism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having sex World's all the time like in, a, in a socialist. It's, patriotic nationalist society if you're a leftist don't feel at any time that you have to hate some cultural marker in your country because you're leftist well, it's I agree you, can hate many, you can hate american football if you want but don't think you'll be any more leftist by doing it and realize that you're going to alienate a lot of people if you go on about it yep for me the, the issue with american football is i think the biggest issue is like a medical issue you know um and then you have also like, I've, I've learned that you don't get paid when you're a college football player nope you're, no. you're in US, you don't get paid by your 22 there's some football there's some changes like, there's some you have an opportunity to you have the opportunity to attend some of the highest degree institutions in the world and just because we don't give you the time to study <laughs> Or I just feel, we have you banging your head as running fast, fast. You can't against another. Don't you? You are lucky, and you need to seize the opportunity. World class education, right? Yeah. Is that your white person voice, Marcus? Yeah, that's the that's my dean of the college voice. <laughs> uh, that whole the whole case on how that came to be, I think, is actually very interesting. Um, uh, I want to say it was in the fifth or the 60s a couple college athletes actually broke their legs and weren't going to be able to play anymore and they actually sued the NCAA uh, for lost wages and that's when they started no you're a student athlete yeah that's and crazy you are, you are a student first and an athlete second um, and now the, the new national labor board secretary said that uh, college athletes <laughs> is they're all laborers and they need to have a union like in, in, mm. the, UK, in the uk in football you have if you get to 18 you have to be given a professional contract or released yeah well so 
what we're starting to see now in the states is kind of we're importing the european model of youth athletics yeah. so as you know uh in well soccer I hate, I hate to saying that to people from the UK, but uh, in, 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 in football, you know, you guys start at a very young age and there's almost a class of athletes. It probably, yeah. I, I, you probably would agree that there is a class of people that get into athletics because you have to go away to the to schools. There's a very extremely small minority of Americans that actually go I think Landon Donovan went, but I think he might have been a teenager by the time he went. Um, I actually have a, a personal friend that I know. His son has been in um, Spain since he was 13 years old um, playing. And now we're starting to see that with basketball. So whereas before you you could play your way out of the hood, <laughs> now you need so much specialized training, Um there's so I mean, many camps. In, in the UK, like our probably lots, our probably most prominent working class figures are footballers, and mm -hmm. football is like uh, footballers are overwhelmingly working class and massively more kind of like black than the than the general population. So I don't think professionalization younger on has to be like that. But I think, and also I think in the US there's like lots of pay to play, including with soccer. Like in the US, yeah. you go to send your kids to an academy, you yeah. pay them instead of yeah. them. They're paying, paying yeah. You, like, in in Britain. In Britain, because the football clubs are more tied, like you don't have franchises that move around the country. You couldn't move Hull City to like. They're more these. tied to the to the to they're, the area that they're, they're in. More, so that some of these clubs are like big money makers, and so there's obviously a social pressure within the community to like give back to the community. So a lot of these academies and things are like are the product of the like uh, the 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 kind of structure of British football which is very tied to a locality. These clubs have deep roots in, 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 in the society. So even if they're owned, like you could be an American businessman and buy Manchester United, but you can't move Manchester United uh, somewhere. You can't, move it. yeah, you can't move it to the, you can't move it to London. So you, uh, so there's a lot more integration into the community. So there are mechanisms for local kids. If you, uh, in your local town, to get into professional football by being in these training academies, by going I mean, to these, but they're also they're also getting kids from different countries as well. I mean, let's, yeah, they let's get. I mean, that's a more that's a newer thing. But like, there's there is a lot. They like there's a long tradition of these football academies for like the talented kids. And how do you become the talented kid, right? And that's kind of what I'm talking about here in the states. You're seeing a lot more personalized training at extremely young ages. You know, yeah. AAU basketball, I think, starts at six. So to your point, uh, Stefan, about like paying for these sports, you know, you're paying to yeah. do travel teams and it's year round. So in my day, you know, you just you played multiple sports, if if not yeah. for your your municipality, for your school. You played football, you played baseball, you played soccer, basketball, ran track. Now it's I like, feel like the only sport I feel like like the United States that always had like a different model is like hockey. Um mm -hmm. and that's to deal with like rink fees. It's like a, a like way like just so expensive to fucking play. Um it's also I mean, kind of, sports are expensive to play. The US structure is also kind of held in place by the fact that you don't have many foreigners that play your games, right? So like the whole structure of European football is as you mentioned, like it's like there's massive amounts of importation of like Brazilians or whatever, while the US doesn't really have this like a few Japanese baseball players or like one <laughs> Greek, one Greek basketball player. A giant Chinese basketball. Oh, yeah. player. Well, it's it's the you know, you know, you know, the whole purpose of the 92 dream team was to import US basketball globally and especially in the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. And they got that. And then you get people like Yao Ming. Yao Ming isn't the only Chinese basketball player. Chinese-born basketball player. Jeremy Lin's, I think, from the States. But um, that was what they wanted to do. And they did it. And it, it, extremely successfully. The NBA global project is a massive global project. But it, basketball is nowhere near soccer slash football. Like, nowhere near. I do have but, a question. Go, go, oh, sorry. Go. You know, 
in my travels throughout the world, <laughs> I am shocked sometimes when I'm in bumfuck Brazil and I see a basketball court. I'm like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> that's interesting. Right next yeah. to the church. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I got a question though, especially with the college athletes now getting to the point where they can, you know, own their labor um, in some degree. Likeness likeness yeah that's true that's true just the likeness um it's only in certain states i have to wonder if like the 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 bougieing up of sports is only is if the is like the really the catalyst to why they're even at this point mm -hmm. um in their in the, like the legal effort you know if it yeah. was still a bunch of just poor people the you know, yeah, their like, dad's just doing. They're like, "What the fuck? My kid needs to get paid." Exactly. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> I mean, the Iverson athlete is gone. Yeah. You know, the Ron Artest athlete is is gone. Like that Michael Vick is gone. That hood, that super hood athlete that is on the cover of the magazine with the quote unquote controversial tattoos. That dude's gone now, man. Rick Ross. Have you guys ever heard of Jamie Vardy? Say again. Have you guys heard of Jamie Vardy? Mm -mm. He's a very famous uh, working class English football player who's now getting a Hollywood biopic. Um, he was he was like in prison and he was playing in like the eighth division with like a an ankle bracelet on, and then just by absolutely skip like absolutely mad skill and kind of really late development, he went from division to vi division to division to division until he got to Le Leicester within the Premier League and won the Premier League. The only time and then it's the first time a a non like big six team had won the Premier League in like twenty years. A really incredible story. So you do kind of have some of those hood people still in the UK. Yeah, the, like you said, Stefan, it's still a working class sport in the UK. And there's like and and you gotta understand the infrastructure that is required to play football, I mean or soccer as you call it in America, is a lot less than you need to play American football, right? Uh, or it's a lot less than you need to play baseball. So mm -hmm. like it's a lot less than even you need to play basketball. Like when I was a kid, we just put two two t-shirts down, two coats down as a goalpost, and play football at lunchtime, right? So like I, I, played, I played football last Monday on like a wet tennis court with jumpers for goalposts, and I was like, I think I'm getting too old for this. Like my friend slipped over and like did his ankle. Like what the fuck? I mean, that's how that's football is for me. I don't know about I can't speak for Marcus and, and Pascal. I mean, I we grew up, you know, playing two on two. Yeah, uh, that's what Wall on the street. street. Yeah, I mean that was that was our shit. You know, I actually was a rugby player though, because because I'm partial. Partial, partial. I, and and not just a rugby player, a rugby union player. I tried to look up the difference, but I couldn't work it out. One's faster. One's faster. Rugby league is a working class game. Rugby union yeah. is the partial's game. So, um, you notice how Gene loves bragging about how Pasha all of his British life was, yeah. you know, and then he comes, it, he comes to America and pretends he's like a pro academic and all that. He's like, Really? Yeah. I'm, a no, I'm a Pasha, but I'm a Pasha from Hull, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, is it well, yeah. like, is it a different just rugby horse on horse horses horse or thing. something? No, I wasn't that Pasha, I was, uh, I was, uh, medium Pasha because you can't be, you can't be, you can't be top level Pasha in Britain if you're not like Lady. Lady Sheffield. Yeah, like we still have an aristocracy. You can't buy your way in. It doesn't matter you how rich you are. You can't be the super posher. So some guy that's like lives in a crumbling old mansion of 500 years is going to be like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not interested. Yeah. You like, can come to his club with a million pounds. You'd be like, oh, go away. <laughs> go away. That's what Americans don't get. It's like money doesn't buy class in Britain. Inbreeding does. Yeah, generation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm debating whether or not when I hang up this call and before I record the audio only podcast of this episode, I should go down to the corner eatery that is very pro Trump and have some barbecue and watch college football because I want to watch college football, but I'm kind of scared of the pro Trumpiness of the place. Just get your MAGA hat and walk out. Yeah, that one, and you'll be good. <laughs> the blacks for trump shirt that you were showing me the other yeah. day just pop I, that on i i keep i keep a uh for real i keep a, a make america great again hat Ooh, in my office got, just in case. Jane, clements, Jane clements with the clap back i love the way this has devolved into a boy sports thing after the brave feminist discussion <laughs> <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> 
Not uh, fired. We're um, getting shots, man. Is um, it is it patriarchal though to assume that sports are <laughs> women? Hmm? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Does, yeah. Doing a sexism there. <laughs> Women's football in the UK is finally getting like a bit serious. It's good. Women's football's good. Like I watched like w- women's football and I was like, you know what? They have like a good short game. Like it's yeah. it's kind of there's a lot more technical play in the women's football, which it's makes it well, someone yeah. someone asked this question. I will answer this question on air. Oh nope, not that question. <laughs> Jason, would you go to a German restaurant that is pro Nazi? First of all, who the hell has a German restaurant? Yeah, what's a German <laughs> restaurant? Second of all, Turkish <laughs> restaurant. Probably not. <laughs> Third of all, he'd probably get strung up and lynched if he did. <laughs> he'd be the he'd be the Kaiserkuchen. I mean, if the German restaurant that's pro Nazi is playing uh, the games on multiple screens, yeah. well, if they yeah, think yeah. you they, the they can, is on point. If they think you, they can turn you into Andy, no, they might keep you around for a bit. <laughs> like we want to send this Negro out to catch a milkshake or two. <laughs> oh. <laughs> To show the oppressive left, <laughs> the, yeah, the oppressive. The, the to reveal the violence in the system, as Foucault said earlier, the left system. <laughs> now I'm going to be looking for the uh, the Nazi eatery. <laughs> Reich and fries. <laughs> But just just that comment actually is making me question. Like, yeah, maybe this is a bad idea. It's no games for me today. I mean, like, how how, how Trump Trump are, they? are they just normal? Like, normal? Jeff, There's you know, about thirty percent of the country is pro Trump. But like, do you like, mean them or like? It's I've been well, I've been to the place well, before. January six, like. Yeah, yeah. Did you know yeah, there's any like absences around them? It's on some. It's on some like. Anti-vax. Yeah. <laughs> you go in with a mask, or they turn you away. Yeah. yeah, like what are you, what are you doing? Just like totally, like they like well, they take a vaccine card and make sure it's blank. Because they had this thing on their, they have a marquee, right? And it's like, um, you know, hey, we got breakfast now, and there's come for the ribs, and then it yeah. says, and recall Newsom. It's like, oh, <laughs> that's uh, hmm. And so I was asking my friends, I was like, um. Are they kind of pro Trumpy over there? And and the people I was staying with it were like, Yeah, they're like, it got kind of bad. <laughs> they're not just accelerationists. <laughs> they're like they they're pretty obvious. So I was and I walked by one day and uh, the guy that was working the pit, because they had their their actually their smoke pit that they do their meat in out outdoors. That's and he saw me, he said, Oh hey, he was very friendly. Yeah. Trump but people are very because he was getting the pit ready. He was like, "Oh, hey, <laughs> hello, Trump, neighbor." Trump, Trump people are very friendly in Springfield. They just don't talk about Trump around them. Like, <laughs> I have to navigate the world of Trump people. It's fine. They do control all the barbecue places. So, is there know. much? You, is there much? <laughs> is there much Trump talk in the U.S. at the minute, or is he just kind of like the king, king over the water, who's going to return? He's just he, he dominates he dominates the the narrative of everything. He's having a rally today, I think. Yeah. In Iowa. What's his? He's like I was in Costco the other day, and they had like a guy with like Trump flags all over his car, like Trump twenty twenty, Trump twenty twenty four. You know, like the, the, there's like Isn't people he are eighty two. I guess Biden is the same age. He's so. he, yeah, he threatened the governor of the state of Florida, which is my state. To not think about running in 2024, that would be a bad idea. So it would be playing. a bad idea. So funny. He's playing. You know, you know, Biden and Trump were born in the same year as Bush and Clinton. You've had four presidents that were all born in the same year, 1948. That that was a, that was a good year. I think that's actually the same amount of uh, men that went on to become president who were at. Uh, in Texas during the JFK assassination. <laughs> Let's not think about that too much. 
no, I think Trump, Trump, Trump's something's going to happen. Like it's like Trump's going to get a heart attack or something and not be able to run. We don't gonna... necessarily know that. I mean, I think this. He does not look healthy. They hit Bernie with the heart attack I gun. Healthy to you too. I mean, would you know one of them look healthy? No, like I, it's going to be a race to the grave for those two. Like it's like who's going to die first? And then we're going to get. The... President like Trump Trump memes where they like take off his toupee and like give him like a, a cut beard, you know? Like, yeah, if, if you were like this, you get a lot more respect. Oh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, it's too depressing to talk about Trump and Trumpism right now. If we had a good show, we had a very, very interesting subject matter. Let's not depress the audience with this stuff. We could have a whole show talking about how this nonsense could happen. Well, thank you, Stefan, for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you on. I would like to have you on more often. So, Gina, step on, mate. Know. Appreciate your appearance, mate. All right, Blip. <laughs> Marcus, <laughs> it's Saturday. I'm watching to see what Ohio State is doing. Drive, drive on down the And don't field. not answer my text when I text you when they lose, because that's just being a punk. <laughs> You take the banter, mate. <laughs> Jean Bajlan, I'll be talking to you and Pascal probably a little later in the day. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for watching the show. Uh, please check out our shows earlier this week. We actually had some really good shows this week. Uh, we had a great talk with uh, Michael Albert about uh, participatory economics, kind of a utopian goal for what we want in a post-capitalist society. And Tuesday, we talked. Who did we talk to Tuesday? Tory Reed and Burton. Cool. Oh yeah, those black people. There's a bunch of black people on the screen Tuesday. You should watch that. It's always entertaining. And Tory Reed. Two weeks. Awesome. We had Rick, the and Richard Wolf show was a good show. It it's been show. a fun. It's been a fun couple of weeks. We uh, we have to. We've got a. We've got to come up with a show for Tuesday. We've got Sarah Mellis talking about birth control in modern China on Thursday with a ladies panel, I believe, Jason. With some, yeah, it's just going to be me and a bunch of women talking about birth control in China. I'll be here, and then there'll be nope, you're off, you're off, uh -huh. you're off. You're off. <laughs> Jason's you write your book. The, he's keeping all the women to himself. He's like, I'm doing the women's <laughs> show. The women's show. You're off. <laughs> you go. You go. You know what? Why don't you go on one of the shows you love so much? Why don't you go fucking? Why don't you and Mark Lamont Hill fucking uh, oh, here we go. sit there and stare at screens? He's gonna Pascal's gonna be on Peacock Thursday no, night. I'll be on the Peacock he, Network next week he, on Medi Hassan show. <laughs> Pascal uh, hasn't Mark Lamont Hill has not uh, come face to face with Pascal yet. Yeah, though. he was getting surgery when I was on his network. Yeah, yeah. How how oh, he convenient. Says. Yeah, oh, so he's the guy took a picture in the hospital after the surgery that, yeah, went, that went viral. He's in Hollywood, man. These people stage that shit. Don't believe me. <laughs> it's simple. I think we got a good idea here. It's like the live Mau Mau Hour on the Peacock app. Peacock app. <laughs> That's Peacock. Down there. And here's the fat back and biscuit band. <laughs> That'd be good. Oh, that would be amazing if Peacock gives you the Mau Mau Hour a contract. And who will he Mau Mau this week? That would be special. It'd be so funny because people are like, what happened to Pascal? You got a contract with Peacock. <laughs> the Mau Mau Hour on CNN. The revolution got televised. That's what happened. <laughs> wow, Shirley coming out with the knives. Jason, stop being jealous of Pascal. He can't help being great. Oh, wow. Oh, Ooh. my goodness. Oh, mm. damn. Is it Fire shots. This is a communal effort, this show. Uh, I, Contrary to what my co-hosts think, I view myself as part of a team. I just happen to, for various reasons, get summoned to other platforms to talk about subject matters that are within my personal expertise because of crises that come up, come up that demand that. But I am always promoting the show and oh, my primary host and my other co-hosts and have always been loyal to viewing this as a collaborative effort. He is the Matt Letizier. 
but shout out to all those people. Uh, Veterans Day is coming up. Um, I hate Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> abolish golf. And um, yeah, I'm I'm here. DMs are open. <laughs> Thank you guys. And uh, I guess we're going to leave with. Uh... Pascal is the most electrifying man in YouTube politics. There you go. Oh, on that note, you guys do not have questions. <laughs> Thank you for the.